Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. everybody and welcome. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi we have uh, brother Ijaz with us today as usual and brother Nazim as well mashallah and Hamza inshallah will be joining us shortly. Uh, this is now our 22nd stream on the historicity of the New Testament. Mashallah so we're really getting through it now and today we'll be discussing Philippians. Um mm -hmm. so without further ado inshallah I'll pass you over to brother Ijaz to give us the introduction and then we'll make some uh, points that we've uh, from our research into this into this particular letter, and then we'll ask, then we invite people to come on and discuss the martial art. Assalamu alaikum, Hamza. Just, yeah. just straight. Well, it's How are you guys? Alhamdulillah. So, Jaz, brother, Thank take you. it away. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Imran. I want to say it's a pleasure to be with you guys, and we're really excited for today's stream because Philippians is one of the most important letters in all of the Bible not just of the New Testament, but in all of the Bible. And that is because it is said to contain a very early hymn. Now, before we get to that, let me mention some basic details about the epistle to the Philippians. So Philippi is a city that I think was founded just after the time of Alexander, during the time of Alexander, or possibly by Alexander's father, at about 380 BCE. Um, it is at a major crossroads. It's a very strategic position in the uh, in Asia Minor. So it's meant to be one of the most uh, important cities to the Roman Empire. Now, basically, there were two early manuscripts that contain a lot of uh, uh, the epistles of the Philippians. It's meant to be authored by Paul around the year 60 to 62. So it's fairly later than a lot of the letters we've been looking at. Uh, almost all scholars believe Paul altered it in some form or the other. It contains about four chapters. Most of the text comes from a manuscript known as P46, which dates between the 3rd and the 4th century CE. And the rest of the text of Philippians comes from Codex Maiticus and Codex Vaticanus, both from the 4th century CE. Now, one of the most important things we need to keep in mind is that Philippians may actually meet two rather than one letter. And that is because the initial letter from chapter 1 to chapter 3, verse 1, uh, is meant to be like a letter of support and thanks, whereas uh, the, the, what comes after it seems to be a response, an angry response, as well as a creedal articulation, beginning with Philippians chapter 2, verses, uh, I think, 5 to 11. And I guess we'll get to that as we get to it. I want to give a quick salam to Brother so that I haven't seen him in many months. And uh, I see another mug in Hamza's hand. May I reward you, Brother Hamza? So that wraps up a very brief uh, introduction to the epistle, uh, so to the uh, epistle of the Philippians. Uh, Naz, got anything to add here? Uh, uh, no, uh, uh, basically, um, uh, um, uh, like as you mentioned, it's thought by um, most scholars to be a composition, like of at least two letters sliced together. And um, as you probably already mentioned, um, the reason for that is because in chapter 3, verse 1, uh, Paul seems to end his letter or come to his conclusion like he does in any of his other letters. But then from verse 2 and forward, he has two more chapters in which he um, seems to be quite critical and um, not as op optimistic but pessimistic towards the Philippians. Marshall. Yeah, do you mind if I, so I'm just going to read for you chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and I want you guys to see the dichotomy here. Why scholars think that there are two letters? So, chapter 3, verse 1, ooh, there's some loud noise in the background. Someone's like having a carnival in the back. Um, so, in verse 1, hear how lovely this sounds. Finally, my brothers and sisters, 
Rejoice in the Lord. To write this again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Verse 2, beware of the dogs. <laughs> beware of the evil workers. Beware of those who mutilate the flesh. <laughs> right? So it goes from, hey guys, I love you too. Beware of the dogs, right? So it's a bit of a uh, drastic shift in tone. And we really don't know why that happens. But it happens nonetheless. And that's why scholars say this may very, may very well be two different letters. Obviously here, He's referring to either the Jews who circumcise or it refers to the Christians who continue to follow the law and circumcise themselves. If you guys don't mind, I would like to read um, from Philippians chapter 2. There is a creed from verses 6 to 11. And I'm just going to read it quickly because this is meant to be a creed which demonstrates the divinity of Christ Jesus. And it's meant to be one of the earliest creeds altogether. So it reads... Um, uh, speaking of Jesus, it says, who though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave, by looking like other men, and, uh, and by sharing in human nature. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. As a result, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. What are the issues here? I'm going to tell you now that there are variants here which one affects theology. The language used also affects theology and the translations also affect theology. So I'll start off with the easiest one. Now, you guys have seen me use this Bible before. It's the Nestle Allen Greek New Testament, the 28 edition. And alhamdulillah, I'm blessed because it has two translations in it in the English. One is the new revised standard version and the other is the revised English Bible. So I'm going to put Hamza, I'm going to give Hamza a test. So Hamza has to pay attention while he's munching away on some lovely stuff. So Hamza, I want you to tell me the difference between these two translations, they're translating the exact same text in the Greek. Okay, tell me what the difference is. Uh, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. That's one verse. Here is the second verse. He was in the form of God, yet he, yet he laid no claim to be equal with God. What's the difference? Don't say it again, mate. I don't know. Well, you fell asleep. Okay, I'll give you one. No, I'm listening. I'm listening. But you... Okay, go on. Okay, so I'm going to yeah. read version one, and then I'm going to read version two. So version oh, oh, oh. one says, "Who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited." Okay. Version two, he was in the form of God, yet he laid no claim to equality with God. Okay, so the first one, he's basically saying he's not denying equality, but he's not taking advantage of that equality. Whereas yeah. in the second one, he's saying there is no equality. Exactly. He never laid you know a equality. Right, mashallah, beautiful, handsome man. So that tells you that the word uk, which is like a, it's, it's like a negation of the term, can be applied to different uh, uh, verbs in this, in this passage, which changes the theology of it. Because as a Christian, they will believe that Jesus Christ did claim equality with God because he is co-equal with the Father, right? But this verse, if read in this way, and it's a valid translation, brings about a significant problem. There is also a second issue here, which is when it says, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Now, this is problematic. Why? There are two, there's a variant here. It either says every knee will bow, which is a guarantee by God and a promise, or every knee should bow, a suggestion. So, According to the earliest manuscripts, it's actually a suggestion, whereas in the later manuscripts, it becomes a promise. So when Christians, you know, they argue at the speaker's corner and they say, ah, you will bow to Jesus Christ, you can tell them, mate, it's optional, right? You've got to read the Bible a bit more carefully. So I'm going to leave you guys with that introduction. Of course, there's a lot more here, but I want the others to get their two cents in, inshallah. 
Assalamu alaikum, Brother Sadat, as well. Welcome to the stream. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, I was just reminded also of Ephesians chapter 3 14. I mean, that's just one or two pages uh, before Philippians, where it says, uh, for, for this reason, Paul writes, for this reason, I, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, uh, so that could be another way that some Unitarian Christians might reconcile some of this, is that at the name of Jesus, they will bow to the Father of uh, Jesus. You know, brother, I just wanted to say, uh, mashallah, I like that, I like the, uh, because that's really interesting, because we see a lot of, there are a significant number of Unitarian Christians who do look at the same things, Guys, I think Nazan has fallen asleep. Oh my God! <laughs> I'm away. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> no, this is uh, when your knowledge becomes so deep, then it becomes something that you can do even when you're sleeping. So, mashallah. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's really, it's really good to look at how uh, Unitarians would interpret verses that may seem to, to be talking about uh, divinity of Christ. This, uh, and that's a uh, jazakallah khair, brother Sadat, for that. And I just wanted to add one thing, really, to reinforce one of the things that you said, brother Ijaz. Because when I was reading through the, the letter of Philippians, I noticed like two or three good buyers in it. Uh, and, I, and so when I was reading through, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll mention one, a, a couple of them. So there's one, where, where was the first one? I highlighted them in red here. So the first one was uh, chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. And that was the one that you mentioned, you know, further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those evil evil doers, the mutilators of flesh. And he's really saying, you know, I can write to you again. You know, but watch out for these people. It's almost it's like a, I'm signing off here. And then we see something very similar. We see that in uh, which which chapter is that? And this is chapter four, verse nine. Whatever you have learned and received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the peace of God be will be with you. And again, that's like a goodbye. God be with you. And then we have right at the end the. And to our Lord and glory, uh, to our God and the Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he says, and so we have lots of goodbyes in this, which I think when we were talking about compositions of different letters being put forward into one letter that we have now, I think it sort of holds or gives evidence for that. Uh, so that was quite interesting that although I didn't know about this concept of the of the um, the idea that this had been a composition of multiple letters, it's actually in the reading it's quite apparent. That he's saying goodbye in a quite a few different times. Nah. Yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit perplexing. Do, do proceed, brother. No. no, I was just gonna say it's also quite autobiographical as well. Paul goes into a bit detail with regards to his background and history. So it, um, it's similar to the letter of the Galatians when you had um other missionaries for Christ that were that was preaching a different gospel to Paul. And here Paul is saying that he's basically, um, you know, not just um, another apostle, but he's actually much better. He's worked much more hard and also made more sacrifices than these. Um, so he speaks about like how he's a Jew uh, from the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrew. And he says uh, with regards to obeying or keeping the law, he kept it. Uh, without any fault or without any blame. Um, I, I, and this kind of um, contradicts the idea, you know, like when Christians try to say, you know, no one has kept the law, we're all sinners and, and so on. But here Paul seems to indicate that it is possible to keep the law because at least he's saying that he's kept the law without any blame or, or fault, which kind of contradicts maybe other statements that he may have said that we've all sinned. Um, and all have fallen short of the glory of God. But then in Philippians chapter 3, he's saying that he's kept the law without any fault. Yeah. And even in uh, the is it Philippians 3, where he's talking about the, the circumcised, he's kind of mocking mm. them. He's not just yeah. saying, oh, don't worry, you guys, you don't have to suffer from the circumcision because you're not. He's actually mocking those who believe that they're saved because of their circumcision. So he's actually mm. doing what he was accused of by the disciples in Acts denied that's right it, it, yeah it's just more evidence against him it's amazing he's actually der derogatory kind of laughing at them what's also important is when christians tell us no one i don't like him anyway go on sorry 
subhanallah no worries it, it's interesting when christians tell us no one except christ jesus obeyed the law perfectly i point out to them <laughs> paul's got a point here now he says he too can obey the law without blame now i've asked uh rabbi michael scoback about this and the jews have a slightly different understanding of that passage they don't believe that paul is claiming to practice the law perfectly but that the superficiality of the law he has fulfilled as opposed to the inherent purpose of the law whereas if we take it by the the, the first reading it does seem to indicate he is claiming to be perfect in the law because he is boasting you don't bo boast that you were imperfect you boast if you were good not if you are bad at something. So it does seem, I, I take, I disagree with Rabbi Skobak here, but I can understand the Jewish opinion because obviously they do believe that no one can actually practice the law perfectly. Uh, I mean, also in, in Timothy 1.15, uh, uh, Paul writes, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. Mm-hmm. So if he's referring to if he's referring to himself here as the chief of sin, yeah. then I don't understand how he would have even have fulfilled the superficialities of the law if he's the, the worst of sinners. That's a beautiful point, subhanAllah. That's quite interesting because you see you see this, it's almost uh because what he what happens in the Philippians 3 is there's this self-praise that we've mentioned, you know. If someone, you know, it really starts from verse two, uh, sorry, verse three, uh, talking about really how he has reasons to have confidence in, uh, uh, in, in, in the, in the, uh, in the spirit. And, and then he talks about having confidence in the flesh. And he says about himself how a lot of self praise that he's faultless within even this paradigm. But then it goes on to sort of almost self martyrdom. I've, I've given up everything. If you read from verse seven onwards. But whatever gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. For what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for the sake of all things I have lost. And I consider them God. And he's, and he's really talking about how he's given up everything to attain this, even a forget that now he's spiritually, fault, physically faultless. But now even spiritually, he's faultless. There's a lot of self-praise and sort of self-martyrdom sort of going on here. And, and, I, and it's sort of... It's sort of it almost like he's trying to prove that look how great I am on every single level, you know, physically, spiritually. You have to, you know, have to really just take my word that I am this great individual that you have to sort of uh, obey. Yes. Uh, I'll, you know, I'll, I really Sorry, want to... I've enough of this comment. What comment? Oh, oh no! Just oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> this is nonsense. I, I'll just be honest with you. <laughs> Uh, they tickle me the Christians, honestly. <laughs> because isn't, isn't that isn't that doesn't it go against the whole yeah, idea of speaking it. about the law? Yeah, is, uh, again, one second, one second. And, um, you know, you don't need to be following the law, and the idea that um, you know it's it's all about this, it's all about the faith in Jesus Christ dying for your sins, and then the idea that after Jesus Christ. Paul then started to follow the law perfectly. It's it's an oxy. It's contradictory. It's, this it's is like a. This is like a saying underwater hairdryer. I mean, we know what the words mean, but it just doesn't make sense. You know, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, uh, and also, Paul's going into like uh, biographical detail. He's speaking about the past, like his history. Like when he when he you know kept the law, he kept it perfectly. He's not speaking about the present or the future. Um, uh, and uh, um, it, it's interesting that people generally tend to assume that Paul's opponents are simply Jew Jews, uh, but these are actually uh, Christians uh, who have a different understanding and take uh, to Christianity as to what the essential message of Christ is. And th they believe that you're supposed to follow the Jewish law. It's not just enough to be good, but you're also expected to keep the commandments. Um, even as a Christian, uh, but Paul um, disagrees, uh, and th these other Christians were undermining Paul's apostolic authority, and hence why Paul is very harsh. So he says things like, "I wish, you know, those that say that you must be circumcised, I wish they mutilate themselves." Yes, yes, 
Um, do you guys mind if I read something here? Um, so one of the important things to keep in mind is that some Christians do accept Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11 to be an early creed or to be evidence of a creed. However, the evidence for it being a creed is actually not substantial. And my NET has a lengthy study note on this point. It says, um, this passage has been typeset as poetry because many scholars regard this passage as being poetic or hymnic. These terms are used broadly to refer to the genre of writing, not to the content. There are two broad criteria for determining if a passage is poetic or hymnic. A, stylistic, a certain rhythmical tell, uh, uh, lilt when the passage when the passages are read aloud, um, the semblance of some of of some meter and the presence of rhetorical devices such as alliteration and chiasmus and antithesis and be linguistic and an, an unusual vocabulary, particularly the presence of theological terms, which is different from the surrounding context. Classifying a passage as hymnic or poetic is important because understanding this genre can provide keys to interpretation. However, not all scholars agree that the above criteria are present in this passage. So the decision to type Saturday's poetry should be viewed as a tentative decision about its genre. So this does not mean that because the style looks like a hymn to some people that it actually is because the scholars are divided on this. So it does not mean that Paul, if he is the author, that he is using a pre-existent creed and using it in his letter. This is not the case. It could likely also be an original composition, which would not mean that the belief that Christ was equal with God goes back to the early uh, periods of the Christian faith. I'm sorry for that lengthy study note, but it's important to point out uh, because a lot of Christians will come and say that this does show that Christ is God. Yeah. So shall we get some Christians on, inshallah? Sure. Can I, ask, can I just ask a clarification mm -hmm. question, Ajaz? You mentioned that when you're talking about Philippians 2.6, the variations, the variants that were mentioned, i.e. not considering equality and then considering equality. Mm -hmm. Uh, are not claiming equality and they're not considering equality. Um, uh, uh, which manuscripts were they from? Just for just for information. No, so it's, it's just based on the Greek itself. The word ouk is meant to be like a disqualifier, right? Like how okay. you have the word sane and you have the word in for insane, right? Okay. Or if you have like a, a faithful and you have unfaithful, you have the negation at the start. Oh, so, I see, I see. So, so the word ouk can be applied to different uh, phrases in the sentence. And because it's, a, it's actually not clear, you can read it in both ways legitimately and both ways would be legitimate. But the Christians obviously will take it one way, whereas they're ignoring that it, it's actually ambiguous and it does not have to say what they think it says, which is That's why, it, yeah, which is why it's present. Okay. And the translation is so important. When I read this to some Christians, they're like, "That's wrong," and I ask them, "What's wrong with it?" They say, "Well, it's translated incorrectly," and I ask, "Why?" They say, "Well, he, of course, he claims equality with God. The Bible shows that." And I say, "But Paul is writing before the Gospels, and so if Paul did write this, who are you to determine what the interpretation should be? If it can legitimately be read in both ways, it should not be a problem to read it in the second way. It's just that it's so badly composed that it leads you to two different, very distinct interpretations." Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah for that. No worries. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. But now, th this is also interesting because the, uh, the Orthodox Church depends a lot on these verses. Now, generally in Christianity, as Brother Nazar would know, um, there was the idea of kenosis, that, that God emptied himself to take on the form of a human slave. So while he was, while, while his essence remained the same, he emptied himself of the power of his divinity, basically. Although I, I don't necessarily believe that to be the case. But it's important what it says here. Now, Nizam and I, I think we discussed this on the group previously. There are two words that you should know in Greek. One is morphe, which means form, and the other is schema, which, which means the very plan or the very intricate detail of something. Now, why is this problematic? It says he was in the form of God or in the, or in the appearance of God. If I said that uh, Nazam was in the appearance of a man, you would say, well, if he's just appearing as a man, then he's not actually a man, right? He's just appearing to be one. 
It's just a form that he's took on, not that he's actually a man. Now, if if it if the text had used who though he existed in the schema of God, then you would have no problem here for the Christians, because it would say that in his very essence he was God, and every facet of his existence he is divine. But by not using that term, it actually means he's superficially God. And so what happens here is that some modalists appeal to this verse to show that Jesus, the man, could not be God in any significant capacity. And secondly, it also may mean that he was not initially a God, but eventually became one. And so many beliefs have sprouted out of this one verse. But because it's so ambiguous, almost any denomination can appeal to it. Yeah, uh, and the mon monotheism that Philippians is written is, is is different from the monotheism that we nowadays be believe in. Like we believe that there's only one God, and besides Him, there is no other divine entity. But back then, when Paul was writing, um, you know, there were many different levels or shades of divinity. Um, there was the ultimate God, uh, the one true God, but beneath him there were like many divine agents. And so Jesus is seen as being amongst one of these divine agents. Uh, but then Jesus, instead of exploiting his divinity, he uh, takes on the form of a, an obedient hu human servant. And so God re rewards him by elevating his status to make him become the supreme divine being. So he's above every other creation, every other divine being, but at the same time, he's still below God. Because as, as the hymn ends by saying that all of this is done for the glory of God the Father. And often you find in Philippians, Paul makes this distinction between God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we yep. can hear you perfectly. Very good. Uh, okay, that's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> that means this mic isn't working, <laughs> Um is, is there also the idea in this uh, hymn or possible hymn in Philippians, is, is there also the idea of a juxta juxtaposition with uh, Adam? Uh, so yeah. in as far as Jesus kind of like the second Adam, the first Adam, you know, according to the Bible, sinned. So he, he looked downward rather than upwards towards God uh, and, and he fell, whereas uh, Jesus, you know, didn't do that. I'm just wondering if, if there's if that idea is there. Yeah, um, it was common knowledge that um, Adam Christology was something that was widespread. And so it's thought that the background to this hymn may be that um, Jesus being the new uh, and second Adam, uh, but unlike the first Adam, who was also in the image of God, uh, this new Adam didn't regard equality as a thing that could be robbed or grasped. Uh, but instead, unlike the first Adam, um, he took on the form of an obedient human servant instead of trying to become equal or, or like God. And so those uh, hold to the view that the background is some kind of Adam Christology uh, would say that um, the kenosis or when Jesus um, gives up or empties himself, it's that same glory that Adam had or possessed uh, prior or before the fall. And this is what uh, Jesus is giving up. And so because of Jesus' obedience, um, God now rewards him uh, by giving him an even higher status than what he had before. Indeed. I just want to read out a message that we got from TD, who kindly donated to EF Dower. May Allah reward you for your donation. Uh, TD says, Bismillah, you all have been a big part of my life and journey to and through Islam. May Allah reward you for your efforts and continue to increase you in knowledge. Amin. Shazakadu Kairan. Wa iyakum. Amin to your dua, uh, TD. We appreciate all your kind words and we do this for the sake of Allah. May Allah reward you for your kindness and patience towards us. Amin. Uh, yeah. You guys were saying about the MTN? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, um, so so um, th I think the first time I when I came across this was in a book uh, published by um, Oxford Press um, called Pauline Christianity. Um, I forgot the name of the scholar, but basically referred to this kind of Adam Christology. And, and there's another very good book uh, called Christology in the Making by uh, Professor James D.G. Dunn. And um, he speaks about this kind of widespread belief of you uh, in Adam Christology. And the background to this hymn is that Jesus is now the new perfect Adam, what uh, 
Adam was supposed to be, now Jesus is. Um, and uh, um, the, the, the other background is also um, is to do with this wisdom or Sophia um, that's spoken about in Jewish literature. Um, in the book of Proverbs, uh, this wisdom of God or Sophia uh, becomes personified and takes on a, a, a personality. Um, and in the book of Proverbs in chapter 8, verse 22, uh, when Proverbs speaks in the first person, uh, she, she says, um, you, O oh God, uh, created me and I was the beginning of the, the first of, of all of your acts. And uh, um, so, so this type of like um, way of speaking about wisdom of God being personified as being the first of God's works um is what like some jews what was originally may have been some kind of uh metaphor uh so, some jews um during paul's day took this language very literally and so um they began to speak about moses as being this second god or co-creator uh with god and so um Christians now started to use this same language uh, for Jesus. So in the letters of Paul, Jesus, such as First Corinthians, uh, Jesus is also referred to as Sophia or as, as the wisdom of God. And so it's commonly believed that this background is behind this hymn. Mm. And, and some scholars think that um, this hymn is either, you know, was invented by, by Paul himself or it's pre-Pauline. But there's one scholar, a Jewish scholar by the name of Giza Vermesh, and he actually believed that this hymn was interpolated or added later uh, to Paul's letter. Well, what's peculiar is verse 9, it says, As a result, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. Now, there's a problem here in that... Um, gave him the name that is above every name. There's a variant. It can either read one of two ways. Gave him a name that is above every name or gave him the name that is above every name. The problem is, if Jesus' name was meant to include the name of Yahweh, then the, the smaller construct, the primary construct, Yahweh should be the primary name and that would be the name above every other name. But in this case, how can Yeshua be a name greater than Yahweh? It doesn't make sense because the son is not greater than the father at all. And if the son pers if the son is begotten of the father, then he would not have a greater name because this name is existent. It came into existence at some point in time. It didn't pre-exist uh, as the father did. So it's confusing and it doesn't make much sense. I want to raise this question to Christians. They actually concede, yes, Yahweh is the superior name as given in Exodus 3.14, but it's not the name uh, used by Jesus here. Paul here, sorry, do forgive me. Does that make sense, guys? Or is that too, many, too much details? I'm not sure. Uh, uh, okay, brothers, shall we put the link out to get some Christians in, inshallah? So the link good. is out, inshallah. We have some Christians in the back. Um, uh, please, all priority is given to Christians if they could come on, uh, discuss the points that they made, and uh, we'd be happy to talk, inshallah. Hi, Pat. You're on with us. Yeah, I'm not sure if you said something to me or not before. My internet there got cut it off. I couldn't hear you. I had to log back in. No worries, Pat. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah, I'm hearing you good. But you want to start off with some points, any responses to anything that we've said on this topic so far? I just want to give a quick shout out to everyone in the comments. Thank you for joining us today. Please, please share the link. You need to get those numbers up, inshallah. And don't forget to smash the like button. And if you can, invite some of your Christian friends to join us. And did Nazem just teleport like 10 feet back onto a coach? Or am I like missing something? Wasn't that's what are you doing? Uh, I'm relaxing now. I feel like I've never <laughs> have a break. <laughs> okay. No worries. All right, Pat, go right ahead. Let's hear from you. No, I wasn't gonna stay on too long. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to make uh, one comment. I think 
I'm not sure if is one of the verses you're talking about is Philippians chapter two, verse eight. Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah, I think I'm not sure, but no, I think I'm referring to number seven. I think it says uh, trying to in the, in the IV. I think it says uh, I can't remember what it says right now, but I think it says something that would say something a lot different than the King James version, like the King James version said, um, made himself no reputation. I'm not sure if the NIV says uh, he emptied himself. So uh, I guess my point was it's important to, I believe, to use a King James version to interrupt, interpret the verse because I believe like the NIV often or sometimes will misinterpret the verse. It doesn't give a proper interpretation. Would you like me to read the verse? From the KJV? Yeah, it depends on what... Um, yeah, if you want to, go ahead. Well, you're making a point about this, aren't you? Yeah, but my point is, like, if... Like, if I'm saying in chapter 2, verse 7, but made himself a no reputation... Um, I'm not sure if the NIV, if I'm getting the correct. Okay, okay. Verse for so the KJ. Oh, okay. I'll make I think the KJV emptied himself. Okay, I'll read yeah, the KJV and I'll KGV. read the NIV. I'll read the KJV yeah, go ahead. and I'll read the NIV. Right, relax a second. I'll read the KJV. I'll yeah. read the NIV. Then it doesn't tell us the difference. One second. Okay, so this is the KJV, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. That's the KJV. NIV. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. The same, isn't it? Yeah, I must have been thinking of a different verse. Um, I was thinking of a verse where it said he emptied himself. As far as I know, there's a verse like that somewhere in the in the New Testament. But I must have been thinking of it somewhere else. Maybe it was in Colossians or something. But. No, Pat, was you aware of the nature of this stream? No, I, I mean, I listened to a little bit of it before I came on, but I didn't get it all. Did you know it was about Philippians? Was it Colossians, was it? Or <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, please. Yeah. You know what? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Hello, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. wow. That's you a can, deep voice. You can hear yeah, me now? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear us? Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. In defense of uh, Pat, though, I, I think he is sticking with Philippians uh, because Philippians, uh, yeah, in, in verse two, chapter two, verse uh, seven, it, 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 some translations do have it as he emptied no, himself. Is that NIV not the case? I read from the KJV. It doesn't say in any of those. Yeah, it he made himself. It said he made himself nothing. Uh, maybe yeah, NASB, uh, he emptied himself by taking the form of a bond servant. A new yeah, the American NASB Bible says, it. says empty. Yeah. Uh, but then, it's, uh, oh, then, they, then they, they say emptied himself, but then it says, i.e., laid aside his privileges. So he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Yeah, but have you, have you got the italics where it says that means no. give up his privileges? No, italics, that would be like the translator's own interpolation. It, it's not there in the Greek. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, okay, okay, fair enough. It's just a commentary or interpretation. Yeah, uh, it says so, ek no sen, so it does mean empty, like to remove, like to take out, basically. Yeah. So yeah. Take, yeah. Does that answer the question? No? I don't understand the point being made. I don't understand the question. Uh, Pat, what is your view with regards to what did Jesus exactly emptied himself of? I Sorry, guess my Pat. point was like, yeah, that would be a, a wrong interpretation why he emptied himself. That's that was the point. Why I was do you to think it's wrong? That. 
So you're saying he did empty control. himself? Well, I don't believe he actually emptied himself in any way. What do you believe happened? Well, I believe like the King James interpretation is the true interpretation. What does that mean? That's, yeah. <laughs> My point was that I was just trying to make that is I believe some versions like the NIV will sometimes give the wrong interpretation of the verse. Yeah, it wasn't so the NIV that maybe, said that. It's the Greek that says yeah, it. I it's that. the Greek. It's the Greek that says yeah, it. I, yeah. Okay. Well, that's all I had to say, guys. I appreciate you for having me on. Well, that's you guys to go on somebody else. Well, thank you for coming. We appreciate your time. Have a day, guys. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. I got so excited, uh, Nazar, when you said you got Christians lined up for us. That's one of your Christians, <laughs> wasn't it? Um. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> did you tell him what the, uh, uh, tell him what the stream was about? First time um, I've met Pat. <laughs> uh, a, a sister contacted me. Um. <laughs> um. She oh, asked me goodness. that she had a friend oh. who wanted to come on the stream. That's funny. <laughs> all right, Frank, come back. All is forgiven. Hello. How are you doing, mate? Good <laughs> evening, man. How are you? Hi, Frank. Hi, Frank. Hi, Frank. Yeah, um, I'm really there, glad you're be Frank, issue, follow that. There's, there's no stream without Frank, so. Yeah. I said, follow that. On. Follow Pat. Let's see what you got. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do. So, um, with, with this. Uh, passage then in, in chapter two like where where does it end up it ends up with jesus being exalted to the highest place and every knee bowing to him and every tongue confessing his lord so it's clear what it's saying about the equality bit and the thing is um Hamza, the last week on your stream i was telling you about the book of daniel oh yeah and see this this whole idea about Jesus being exalted to the highest place. It's there, it's there in Daniel. And I'm just going to read you a bit from uh, Daniel chapter 7. This is in verse 13. And he's, 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 just, he's seeing the throne room of heaven. He's seeing the beast destroyed. And he says, In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power all peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So here, here in Philippians, Paul's describing that same thing. You've got Jesus elevated to the highest place. He's, he's the king over God's kingdom, which will never be destroyed. Okay, Frank, a couple questions here. It doesn't say he was exalted to the highest place. I think you've read that into the text. It said he was highly exalted. It does not mean he was the highest of the exalted. Secondly, it, it's not a promise that every knee will bow. It's actually a variant in the Greek, and the earlier variant says every knee should bow. It's a suggestion, not a requirement or a fulfillment of a promise. So, yeah, there you go. Well, I'm just taking the, the words in the NIV are exalted to the highest place. So I'm not sure what you're quibbling about the translation there. But, even, but it, because it doesn't say that in the Greek. But even even if you take it, every knee should bow, it's still saying the same thing. We're, they will be compelled to bow. No, should is a no. suggestion. If I, say, a... Yeah, if I say to you, you should go to the park, it doesn't mean I'm telling you you have to go to the park. But if I say you will go to the park, it means you have no choice. Take all the time you need. Take all the time you need. So is um, so this is God saying, well, it'd be a really good idea if people did this. Pretty much, it's a suggestion. I, I, yeah. I think it's quite clear what, what it's stating that. Well, Jesus, fine. So to, that's the expectation. The whole message of the gospel is about the coming of the kingdom of God, and this is showing Jesus is the King of the fine. kingdom of God. Frank, it doesn't matter what the English says, it matters what the Greek says. And the Greek the Greek. Says, yeah, the Greek says every knee should bow as a suggestion. It has the no requirement of bowing. Yes, in the NIV, the English says the same, every knee should bow. Yeah, it doesn't say every knee will bow. 
And so there have been many tomes written on this one variant, but the point is it is recognized as a variant and the meaning is changed. So while you can say, well, the context can be influenced by other factors, the fact is the text itself does not say what you wanted to say. So I'm a bit surprised that you're arguing the point when, I mean, okay, Frank, you do me a favor. Let's, let's just do a quick you know, example here. What is the difference in English between the word should and the word will? It depends on the context. Well, in the context, yeah, give it to me. Well, I think here, look, let me ask you the question. What do you think Paul understood this to mean? What was he saying? That it is better for you to submit to Christ willingly than being forced to do so when you are punished, as it's mentioned in Zechariah chapter 14. See, well, it, didn't take, just... it didn't take me two seconds. He's suggesting yeah, yeah. that you should do it. No, so Zach, so you've jumped to an Old Testament passage, and you now to, you've got to explain that one. You jump uh, to Daniel. I can do the same. No, no, and, well, in Daniel, there's a clear expectation that there is God's going to appoint a king mm -hmm. over all the earth, that the kingdoms of the world will come to an end, mm -hmm. and that there'll be a king. And it's when Jesus comes thing. preaching the gospel, it's the, same thing in the gospel is about the you. kingdom of God. You know, I, I mean, when Frank asks, what, what did Paul intend or think when he wrote that in Philippians? Number one, we can't really go into his mind. We can't travel back into time and see what his intentions were. But if we try to do that, then we could also try the same for Daniel as well. We could ask, what do you think the Old Testament writer who wrote Daniel was thinking? Was he thinking that this king will be God himself or this will be a king appointed by God? He will be given a dominion. If you're God, you don't have to be given a dominion. You don't have to be given a government or an authority because everything is intrinsically yours already. So I think if, if we were to be fair and ask the same question about Daniel, I, I, I highly doubt that the writer of Daniel is anticipating the coming of God in person incarnate. I think, can, can I just add to that, Frank, very quickly before you, from, because you know, we, Muslims, we also believe that Christ will come again. And we also believe that he will, rule so with the idea of god giving jesus peace be upon him a high status on his return we have no problem with this at all and when we read through this it says god exalts him and even at the end it says to the glory of god the father so we have a, quite a lot quite a distinction being made between god who exalting jesus and then the glory being and and the glory and this is done for the glory of god the father and so the father is always referred to specifically here in, in this passage as god and none of this would indicate, but without having the Trinitarian lens that Christians come with to look at it, that the individual who's been exalted is themselves divine. I think that's something that's added into it. And that's just just because as Muslims, we also believe Jesus is returning. And we also believe he will be the ruler. And you have to, either you're with him or you're on the wrong side. We, we completely accept this as our own uh, belief in the end times. I mean, to that. So, uh, well, absolutely. And our concept now really is, this is about, for clarifying is your concept correct are you going to be following jesus has his teaching or are you going to be following a uh a, you know something that's been taught by paul or, 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 or others about jesus that is not correct so when we read this for us it's quite clear god's exalting him and everything that is being done is for the glory of god the father so if you were to take this even as something historically reliable it doesn't point towards the trinitarian concept that you're you're presenting if that makes sense but it's saying that the way you glorify God is to glorify the son he sent. And like if you read through the book of Revelation, which is spells, spells out how this all happens, at the end you've constantly got the, the God the Father and the Son. They're, they're there together and they are one. But Jesus is, we can, we can see Jesus. God the Father is the invisible God who we, we, never, we never see. What? I don't get your point, Frank. Um, oh, actually, Frank, just one second here. When you said that uh, if you honor the son, you honor the father, this yeah. does not make the son God because in Islam we have the teaching, who, he who does not thank the people does not thank God. It does not mean that we consider the people to be God. It just means that you honor God by honoring his guidance towards fellow human beings, to, to fellow mankind. That's what it means. I don't see how you can get uh, your Trinitarian ideology here. And secondly, to be quite honest, verse 6 
could actually be believed in by a Muslim because though he was divine, he did not seek equality with God. We can believe that as well. He was a holy man, but he did not consider himself to be equal with God, but rather subordinate to God. So as a Muslim, we can say amen to this verse. So it, it doesn't say what you think it says, uh, especially in the Greek, which is why it's so important, read it in its original language. Yeah, can I just add something about the analogy of honor the father, honor the son mm -hmm. and all that? So basically, give you an example of when a king sends a messenger. The messenger is a representative of the king. Therefore, you should treat the messenger as if it's the king. The words the messenger speaks are the words of the king, not the messenger. Therefore, you should honor those words as if the king himself was in front of you. That's the analogy of what I would refer to when um, it says honor the son as you honor the father. But see, Jesus told the parable of the, of the tenants where he, he has this story that there's a, a man, he sets up a, a vineyard and he gives it to people to look after it. And then he sends his messengers, to, his servants to go and collect some of the some of the rent, basically. And they successively, they, they, they mistreat and, and kill all these servants. And in the end, he says, I'll send my son. They'll respect him. And he sends his son and they kill the son. And clearly, and the, and the Pharisees understand that Jesus is talking about them, that they're planning to kill the son. So the son is, the, the others were just messengers. The son is the embodiment of God. How did you just leap to that then? Sorry? How come you leapt to the embodiment of God? Where did that come from? From that parable? Because the son <laughs> is different to the other messengers. Yeah, but the son is different to God as well. He's not. What do you mean he's not? He's not God, is he? Look, the, the, the word son, obviously it's, it's symbolic in a sense. But my, I have two sons. You know, they are the embodiment of me they're not me <laughs> they're, they're they're separate they're individual but they're the embodiment of me in a way different different to you know somebody i work with or some of that yeah you hold them in high esteem frank and that's and we understand that and i think that's the what the point the parable is making. Look, I just, i'm sending just I got it. Can I just one Sorry, from Revelation yeah, because that was just what i was going to say before see in revelation uh, chapter 21 in 22 he says I did not see a temple in the city, this is the New Jerusalem, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So they're always, they're together there in the, they're always to represent together in the new kingdom. You know in your parable, who, who are the keepers of the vineyard? Um, people. <laughs> Which people? Um well, God's give, given the world to people. We, we are in the world. So the vineyard is the world? Yeah. Huh? So what's it between people and prophets? The prophet is the intermediary between God and the people. He's a messenger from God to the people. So what's the difference between people and the prophet? So he's people and the prophet. Mm. Well, the prophet is from, he is one of the people. But he said, is he high, God is higher esteem than the people. So high. Is he in? Is he held in higher esteem than the people? Um, well, he may not be, but God's chosen him. No, I'm just trying to understand why you jump from the people, the, the keepers of the vineyard, are just random people, and then the the, the one that God sends um, is God, rather than just being a prophet or something. I, I'm just trying to understand how you jump to that God incarnate thing. Well, it's it's a picture of the king of the world, like the people, like God's given them you know, a vineyard, he's given us the world, but they're in rebellion against him. They're not acknowledging their, you know, the owner, the creator, and uh, God sent various messengers to try and get them to... Oh, so now they're messengers now? No. The keepers of the vineyard, they're, they're, they're messengers now? No, no. Uh, do you want me to read the parable to you? No, I understand. It's, it's, you, know, you can look it up afterwards. It's in Matthew chapter twenty-one, from verse thirty-three. You should know onwards. Frank. You should know Frank. You know, should know Frank. You should know at this particular point, anyway. As far as I'm concerned, I don't care what Matthew said personally. <laughs> after the Matthew streams, but anyway. But how come all these story, all these gospels, they all what Paul says, they all tell the same story. They all lead to the same conclusion. They don't. They don't. Have, Frank, have you seen yeah. the previous things? 
God is trying to, is going to restore the kingdom. That's what it's all about. The the kingdom was lost at at um, when Adam sinned. At the end of time, the kingdom will be restored. And in the meantime, people are entering God's kingdom as they put their trust in Christ. He's made a way open into the kingdom. The kingdom of God is accessed via repentance, as Mark says. So we, of course, we agree with Jesus that to get to the kingdom of God, you have to repent. It doesn't mean that it's a reference to his divinity. I really don't know how you get that, to be honest. Well, Frank, I think you Frank, have to... Frank, do me a favor. What, what should I do? Yeah. You have chapter 2 and your verses 6 to 11, right? So are we back to Philippians now? We were always on Philippians, Frank. <laughs> Well, we've, we've, we've wandered a bit. <laughs> well, you took well, us to Daniel, then you took us to Re uh, to Matthew, and then you took us to Revelation. So it's you doing the wandering, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's because the it, the, the scripture um, interprets scripture. You have to look at how it all fits in. Yeah, but you got offended when I went to whatever chapter it is I went to. <laughs> no. um, Frank, do me a favor. This is 6 to 11. What, what in these verses demonstrates that Jesus is God? The, the very first, like in verse 6, it's in, who in the form of God. It's the morph of God. Morphe. Yeah. Morphe. Mo but, morph but, means form, body, whatever. Yeah, you've got metamorphic rock. and it, it, it's a, yeah. Frank, were you here for the very start of the stream? Yeah, yeah. And also, but, there's Frank. the word isa. Like, we, we use the, you know what an isosceles triangle is? Yes, Frank. It's do you got know two, what I mean? Sides, and we like. I do technical stuff. We use the word ISO for things that are same, like ISO bars is the same pressure. Uh, um, ISO therms is the same temperature. ISO means equal. So you, the words are there. Right. So, Frank, I'm going to read from two different translations. Did you hear when I did this earlier? Yeah, yeah but mm -hmm. the translations are just translations. It's the Greek that's important. <laughs> Indeed, which is why, because, no, but that's a good quote. Why? Because the translations bear out the ambiguity in the Greek, right? So when you think it says Morphe uh, Theo, when you think it says it's the form of God, it can mean the form of the divine, the form of a divinity, which is perfectly fine in the, in the Hebrew uh, understanding of the world at least at that point in time, because we are all on a scale of divinity, basically. However, just tell me the difference between the word schema and the word morphe. Actually, I, I can't tell you that that level of technical detail. Right. But morph means but, but hold on, But hold on, Frank. Right. So morphe can mean form and outward appearance. Would you agree to that? Um, I'm not sure about the outward appearance. Um, in well, fact, and, yeah. like, well, let me give you a... Aristotle used morph, uses morph for form, the, the physical substance, whatever. Right, so Frank, let me let me do you a favor. Have you ever watched the Power Rangers? <laughs> no, I, I, can, I can remember my kids watching them, but no, I haven't. Okay, right, they're called the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers because despite changing their form, they're the same person. Okay, their essence is still the same. So the word form means outward appearance because it goes on to specify he was in the likeness of a man referring to his flesh, but internally, what was he? So yeah, he might have the appearance of a divine being because he is being given the attributes of God too. Sorry, the attributes of uh, uh, that God has granted him to raise life and to do miracles, right? It makes sense in that regard. It would be very good for your position instead of using the word morphe, but using the word schema here, why? Schema means in your very essence, in your every intricate detail, in every element of you, you are God. So it doesn't use the word schema here. It uses the word morphe. So by that distinction alone, we know it's not saying that Jesus Christ has the essence of God, but rather the outward appearance of a divine person. And that's all it means. I said Muslims can accept, which is why when I read from the, I think it's the revised English Bible, it says, he was in the form of God, yet he laid no claim to equality with God. You can't be in the appearance of God and equal to God. It says he did not lay claim to being equal with God, which removes the understanding that you have on that particular verse. Do you understand? Uh, 
Uh, so. yeah, I think you've, you've partly stated my position. You've said that the essence hasn't changed, although the outward appearance is different. So mm -hmm. he's gone from being in the form of God to being in the form of man. Like when he was on earth, <laughs> he was in the form of man. So that's, that's what he was point. looking like a man, but he had transformed from something before, and at the end, no. he's going to be elevated again. He's going to be transformed back to the high place. I didn't say he was transformed in his essence, which is your. But, but are you, do you accept that Jesus existed before he came to earth? I believe that we all existed before we came to earth. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 we all existed in the mind of God before the pillars of the earth was established. Now what? <laughs> That's it, in, in the mind of God, but we weren't a we weren't an existing being. We weren't in communion with God before then. But Jesus was a was there. <laughs> we did exist God. in the mind of God. But, and like this, and, and really, this whole thing, Paul brings it in as an as an illustration of humility. That Jesus stepped down from being in this high place. He was humbled, and but at the end, he'll be elevated again. That's Frank, the whole sequence. Frank, right? Frank, you've just been making the case that Jesus is equal to God. No, Paul, Paul's making the case. No, you are making the case. Oh, he, he stated, who, who in the form of God, I'm just... No, yeah, you, no, 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 no. When you went to the parable of the, the God, you know, the vineyard and all this business, yeah. and then you, 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 you and uh, who honours the Father, honours the Son and all this. So you believe, because you've just been trying to demonstrate it, that Jesus equaled himself with God. Yes. But yeah. Paul says he didn't. No. He, you, you're no? trying... <laughs> just state again what you, what you say the first five words of verse 6 are saying in, in the Greek. Okay. Do you believe Paul is saying Jesus claimed equality with God? Well, what it's saying is that he didn't claim, claim to hang on to it. Like he said it wasn't saying to be grasped, but it says, although he was in the form of God, Did he, claim he, equality? Didn't, he, deemed it, he deemed it not to be grasped. Did he claim equality? Well, it's, it's not about him claiming, it's about no, him being. Claim? Did he claim? Well, it, Paul's saying he is, like he's being. He's saying Paul being says he that, didn't claim equality. And, and then it says he emptied himself. No, but Paul says so, he didn't claim equality. Okay, it says he didn't claim it, but he said right. but it says he had it. So Paul said he didn't claim equality, yet you're saying Jesus claimed equality. Hold and on. this is why I don't understand. Hamza, he's it, saying that, Hamza, Frank just said that Paul is saying Jesus was equal to God. He's saying the opposite, Frank. What are you doing? Now he's saying he is in the form of God. Uh -huh. But he deemed it, he deemed it to be um, he deemed it not robbery to be equal with God. That's the word for word in the interlinear. But then he emptied himself. So he not he emptied himself. So he emptied himself. So he stepped down from something. But did he claim equality? He, huh? The it's a very simple question, Frank. Did Paul say Jesus claimed equality with God or not? No, he says he is in the form of God. Not did that he, he claim equality, equality with God? He is in the form. Did he claim Sorry? equality with God? He's not. The words are, he is in the form of God. He didn't He didn't um, deem it. Well, Go on, say it, Frank. Say it loud. Say it proud. My giddy well, answer. I'm just the right reading end. the word for word. He, he, but not robbery deemed it to be equal with God, but emptied himself. Yes. Right. The, the, only, the only Bible that says that is NAS, NASB, I think, anyway. I thought you you like the KJV. No, anyway, I'm, I'm just reading an into a Greek interlinear here. I'm just reading the words. Oh, okay. You know, English Did he claim Greek. equality with God? It's a simple question. The answer is no. no. In this in this verse, he's not he's not claiming. It's stating that he has it. It doesn't say he has equality with it's God. Says, so, okay, let me ask you, Jazz. What has yeah. he emptied himself of? The glory that he once had, which God initially gave to him. That's which what is he saying that he. So you're Lord. saying he's he's, step, he's come from heaven, he stepped mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. So you agree with that? I'm saying he had glory at some point in time, and he lowered himself by coming to earth according to the requirements of this passage. Lowered himself by being susceptible to uh, abuse and harm by human beings, which if you exist in the mind of God, 
of course, you're in a better state. You're in communion with God, as you said. But when you exit out of that state and you come to earth, obviously, you're not no longer with God. Hence, in Islam, we have the teaching, inna lillahi wa inna ilahi raji'un. From God we come and to him we return. So we have the same belief, Frank. You just don't seem to understand it. I also want to point out here, uh, you, you, you keep saying in the form of God means he is equal with God. But as I mentioned to you, form equals appearance. It does not mean essence. So you can have the form or the actions that you can do can represent God, but it does not make you God in itself. If Paul wanted to say that Jesus was God, he would say, who though he existed as God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. He could have said that, but instead he says, who though he existed in the form of God. So he changes the phraseology altogether. He does not say, Frank, let's be clear, that he existed as God. He says he existed as the form of God. So I put the question to you, what is the difference between those two statements? He existed as God and he existed in the form of God. What would be the distinction between the two? The spelling of the words. In fact, that's not a joke. This is serious. This is no, your theology. No, no. The, the thing is, where does it end up? It ends up with everyone bowing to to Jesus. No, it what ends up with it, a suggestion. It, it ends up what with a suggestion. Implying? It ends up with a suggestion that we should obey Jesus Christ because he's a prophet of God. Isn't that right, brothers? Would we not obey Christ Jesus? We will because yes. when he returns in Islam, we will accept him as a messenger sent by God in the past, and he returns as the anti, uh, as the Christ to fight the Dajjal, and we affirm that wholly, and we as Muslims promise. In fact, we we actually swear by Allah that if we are faithful Muslims, we will side with him against the Dajjal or the false messiah. So yeah, I absolutely agree with that verse. So when you hear on the last day, you hear the name of Jesus proclaimed, you'll get down on your knees and your tongue will confess that he is Lord. He is my master. He is a Sayyidi. The, the equivalent of the word curio, so curious in Greek is the equivalent to the word Sayyid or master in uh, Arabic. So yes, he is my side. He is my master. He has a higher station than me with God. That's why we say that the prophets have a maqam or a station with God. Uh, what was the second thing? It does not say that every knee will bow to Jesus. It doesn't say that. It actually says that every knee will bow uh, to the glory of the Father. Read the very last line of verse 11. Yeah. It never says to the glory of Jesus. Well, at the name of Jesus, every mm -hmm. knee will bow. Mm -hmm. Every every tongue confess his Lord mm -hmm. to the glory of the Father. And and by the way, yeah, to to worship Jesus is to glorify the Father because they are one. No, to honor Jesus, the word proskuneo, to show honor to Jesus is to honor the Father. Just like I said, he who does not thank the people does not thank God. So in Islam, this is perfectly compatible with our beliefs. Now what, Frank? You see, Frank, you thought you had a Trump card. Turns out you came with a joker. See? I'm sorry, that was... That Frank, Frank, what we, uh, I'm sorry, let me just, I think what I would say, Frank, is what, what's interesting here is well, you see some similarities here. We, we also believe in the return of Jesus, peace be upon him. We also believe that to be with his... And he will be the ruler, and you need to be on his side at that time against the Antichrist. And... Um, we believe that we, he would be honoured, and we have these same. But we're, what we're what we're what we're saying to you is worship that whom Jesus worshipped. Jesus worshipped the Father. He taught to worship the Father. It's clear. I mean, really, it's Jesus never says worship anybody else, and that's all we're inviting you to. Don't even we're not even saying anything else. Just worship who Jesus worshipped. When he got down on his knees and he put his face on the floor, and he, whenever he needed anything. Uh, you know, if you look at the, the you know, in, uh, the story about Lazarus, he always says that he, he turns to the Father, and that's what we're asking you to do. Everything else will follow after that. So, so what we're saying is that when we read through this passage, even though you have your views about it, we can see it without the Trinitarian concept, taking Jesus as an, a great human being that was set, sent to Earth for a specific task, um, and who will return again to do another specific task, and Ultimately, what this is for is the glory of God. And this mention is it's literally written it to the glory of the Father, of God the Father. And so actually there isn't much disagreement. It's just about 
you're holding on to with your molars the trinitarian concept you want to make jesus god and the question really is, is probably a theological one is why is that necessary for you um but we can maybe that's another stream and we can come to that but it's not clear from these uh from this passage that this is a this is a trinitarian um you know passage here yeah frank the the people in the comments really love you you know i notice every time you come on people really like you you know they, they really want good for you they genuinely want good for you so we we hope that you continue to keep an All open right, frank, mind we'll see you friday okay yeah i have to think about what my program is on friday i'll, I'll, I'll see try and think okay. of a very very good question that you can okay. you can ask anything there you see All right okay. that's see fine. you then I mean, since we spoke about the second coming or the parousia of, of Jesus Christ, what's interesting to note is in First Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul's uh, very confident in the return of Jesus, that Jesus uh, would return during his own lifetime. He says, we who are alive and remain on the earth will not proceed or go ahead in front of those who have now already now passed away or fallen asleep. Uh, but in, in his letter to the Philippians, um, in chapter 1, verse 23, and also in chapter uh, chapter 3, verse 11, uh, Paul now seems to have a modification of belief that he now seems to doubt whether Jesus would re now return in his own lifetime. And so he speaks about, like, um, if he does die, then he expects to be with Jesus Christ in the next life. So whereas before, in Thessalonians, he was expecting Jesus to return any time during his own lifetime. But now Philippians is now written many years after First Thessalonians. And now he's beginning to doubt that Jesus may not actually return during his own lifetime, even though he still believes in the second coming. But he, he's not certain whether it will be in his own life. So I, I thought next, that's an interesting progression. Uh, the next guest got excited. I see his eyes light up every time you said the word more. Welcome, Mike Moore. Really? <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> Hello, guys. How are you doing? Hey, welcome. Right, right, right. Fine. Uh, so, what do you want to do? You want to continue this talk about Philippians 2 5 through 11? Well, we're, st we're sticking to the uh, uh, Philippians uh, epistle today because that's the topic of the stream yeah. uh, so we would prefer that if anything uh, just yeah. a quick uh, point to the people in the chat uh, people are saying why don't I go on uh, the man with the hammer who bashed his father's head in stream well that's because I'm live on EF Dawa if the kids want to play they can come here but I will not go to the playground with them thank you so Mike please go ahead um, so I, I was looking at some of this stuff and, and the use of the term morphe. Mm -hmm. um, the Mount's um, Greek dictionary says it's the form or nature of God. It wouldn't um, be nature because nature would be usio or essence. It might be a later use by the church fathers, but it wouldn't be an early use of it, no. Do you have anything to back that up? Your yeah, you, should that? Check the, you should check the Little and Scott um Little and Scott, uh, what do you call it? Dictionary, because the word the word for nature is usio, right? So morphe does not mean usio. It will have taken on a different meaning later on, but the very traditional meaning of the word morphe means form, which is why it's translated as form and not as nature. Is there a particular translation that you know of that uses the word nature here that has been adopted by scholarship? If not, why don't they use it if it's available to them? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, yeah, I think most people, when they when they see the term "form of God," mm -hmm. um, understand it to be um, that He was actually God. Um, especially as as uh, Frank was was alluding to the fact that it says that He humbled Himself. Um, I believe that Christ was an eternal creation, or not an eternal creation. He was an eternal being with God um, and equal with God from all eternity. Um, didn't exist in the form of human form uh, until he humbled himself. Nothing humbled him. Uh, he humbled himself and took the form of a servant. 
um, and came to earth. Uh, some people, I, I think it was uh, Sadat was talking about the second Adam, uh, which is something that Paul talks about. Um, you know, you had the first Adam that came, he had a probationary period. He, um, he sinned in the garden uh, and, uh, and Jesus came as the second Adam um, and fulfilled all of the things that uh, the law required uh, and filled, fulfilled the, the, what Adam fell in, uh, which was obedience to, um, obedience to the Father. Um, and so when, when it says that he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, um, the way I've understood that um, is that he is saying that it's not something that he held on to. Um, he took that, um, he took that, um, the existence, the being of, of in heaven with the Father, and he, he said, you know what, I'm not going to use that as an advantage. I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to come to earth. Um, I'm going to take the form of a servant, and, um, and I'm going to give my life um, to pay the sin debt of, of mankind who had fallen uh, under Adam. Well, unfortunately, Jesus never says any of those things, but I appreciate you mentioning it. Uh, Mike, can you doesn't do me a favor? Him. What things doesn't he say? I mean, Jesus, yeah, that's what Jesus' mission was, right? If you, if, you read the, the old, the, if you read the New Testament Gospels for understanding, um, it says it's all about Jesus' mission of, um, of, of giving his life for the, for the sake of the many, right? Mike, Mike, do you believe the Gospels are historically reliable? Yes, I do. Oh. And I think, I, I, I think most people did until you got into the, you know, 18th, 19th century, the Enlightenment period, the... No, you know. Mike, Mike, Mike. Hold on, Mike, one second, right? Uh, so, Origen, one second, Mike. Uh, Origen was writing in the, in the late second to the... Uh, uh, third century CE, he literally says that the gospels are material falsehood because they speak of one thing happening in one place when it really happened in another, and at one time when it happened at another time. So he looks at them not as a historical document with historical with a historical basis, but rather as given us stories or parables to understand the message of God. And we also have the church father Eusebius in the fourth century stating that the gospels are an agato sudestai, a good lie. And he likens it to a story that you give to people so that they can uh, come into obedience, not that it itself is a historical thing. Uh, and just one final point, Mike. Um, I know we're getting away from the topic here, but I really do need to ask you, when it says, who though he existed in the form of God, if we just stop at that, 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 that sentence there, right? If it was meant to mean he was God, it would say, who though he existed as God. But it, it, it specifies he only existed in the form of God, morphe, in the appearance of God. What does that mean to you? Why does it use the word morphe there and not the word schema as it uses in the very next verse? Well, again, like I said, I believe that, it, that I believe that the translation can mean nature of God, um, and uh, you know, um, if you want to look for a verse that says, you know, that that Christ was God, what do you take Colossians one nineteen as meaning that that Jesus was God when it says that in Him the fullness of God was was pleased to dwell, the fullness of God, everything that is God, was pleased to dwell in Christ. SubhanAllah, in Islam, we believe that God is closest to us than our jugular vein. So yeah, God, we, we can accept the, with, that, with that understanding. It does not you refer to a God. So second, when, it says, when it says the fullness second. of God, yes. when it says My, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Christ, you, you mm -hmm. accept that as being, as being legitimate? That God is present with us everywhere. Yes, definitely. Not that it refers to a corporeal you, attribute, 
but let me finish the point, Mike. Uh, sure. Not that I refer to a corporeal attribute, because as you also believe, God is spirit. And as uh, as I think uh, Second Chronicles says and First Kings, uh, the heavens and the earth cannot contain him. So the presence of God is always with us. We don't deny that. And yes, I fully believe that the prophets of God would have God with them, supporting them in all instances and in all moments. They are never far from God. Hence the Quran says he is closer to us than our very jugular vein. Again, I'm being careful, not saying he's a corporeal body, not saying he's physically present, but just simply saying we are aware of his closeness to us. So, but when it says the fullness of God was pleased mm -hmm. to dwell, that means everything. That means, that means play Roma. That means all of God was pleased to dwell in Christ. Well, that's because right. you can't divide God, can you? Could I just make a comment here, uh, if that's okay, uh, yep. Mike? So, well, it seems to me that if you're saying that in one place it's saying that, that everything of God, whatever we're talking about, was in Christ, and here it's saying that actually Christ was emptied of whatever, some of whatever God was, then these are we're talking about a contradiction in terms of what constitutes Christ in any conception that we're having. So either the fullness of God is in Christ, or it's not. Um, because obviously, before Christ, I assume Christians would believe that, in, that it would be the Son that you'd be talking about. Christ is actually the manifestation of the Son in Christian concept on earth. So if the fullness of everything was within Jesus Christ, as, as you're saying, and here we're talking about it, he emptied himself when he came to earth then these are, these are two opposite things. So I don't know, how are you reconciling this concept? Yeah, because if you think of the fullness of God as a trinity, then then all three persons of the trinity should dwell in Christ. What I'm saying, well, what I believe I is... the heavens and earth could have contained okay, God. In, in the trinity, there's three separate persons, right? So there's three separate persons. Jesus isn't the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit isn't the Father. The, you know, you know the, whole, the whole deal. Um, so when Jesus is um, when Jesus is said to be um, deity, he that doesn't mean that he's the Father. It doesn't mean that he's a spirit. He's the person of the Son. Um, and when he it says that he humbled himself and he took the form of a servant, he didn't not he did not end up being not God, but he a lot he 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 devoided himself of the use of his divine attributes most of the time that he was here on earth. Now, he was able to do certain things. He was able to do miracles. He was able to do um, different things. So there are times in which God used uh, or Jesus used his divine attributes, um, but he didn't use his divine attributes all the time. He could have saved himself from being crucified. You just moved away from the point, Mike. But Mike, you, you were emphasizing you were emphasizing the fullness of God, of you God. Know, dwelt yes. in Him. So it's are you now are, are you backtracking and saying that it's not the fullness of the Trinitarian God that dwelt in Jesus, but it's just some aspect or one third of the Godhead that dwelt in Jesus? Is that what you're saying? God is indivisible, but what I'm saying is is that um, Jesus Christ. Um, let me let me think how how I want to say this. Um, as a person, as the, the second person of the Trinity, he had all of God's attributes. He was he was entirely God, just like the Father is an entire is entirely God, and the Holy Spirit is entirely God. They all have um, they all have they are all members of the of the Trinity, right? They're all members of the Godhead. Which means that they are. It's, it's not. When divided. you say God, are you differentiating? What I think what Sadash trying to get to. When you say God, are you? Is that the three in one, or when you say God, is it one part of the three? I, I'm trying to understand because if you're saying the fullness of God and you believe God is a Trinity, then the Father should be dwelling inside Jesus, according to what you're saying. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that Jesus. Jesus was. 100% God. Um, no, you said, you said God dwelled in him. I said the fullness of deity dwelled in, in Christ, yes. He was deity, divine, the divine oh, nature. God. The divine nature was was fully pleased to dwell in him. We believe, that we believe of course, as, as I think you understand, 
um, that there is one being of God and there's three persons um, that make up that one being of God. All three of them are 100% God, um, and but there are three persons as a part of that, is a part of that Godhead. Well, you said the fullness of God. Sure, Mike, so can I just clarify? Because re really the, the question wasn't really about what the concept of God might be. What, we, what I'm trying to say is that at one point we're saying that everything was in Christ. However you want to phrase that, whether that's the nature of God or the, however you want to say that, whether it's the person, I'm not, that's not really the point. And mm. another place it's saying that he emptied himself. And what it appears to be emptying self off is whatever this uh, whatever this uh, form of nature God might be. So in one part we're saying some nature of God was emptied. In another place we're saying that it was fully within him. And we're talking about manifestation. We're not talking about pre-manifestation in both of those statements. So what I'm saying mm -hmm. is they seem contradictory. Without going mm -hmm. into, I'm not really talking about what constitutes the nature of whatever was within Jesus to start with in, in, uh, in, in, in Colossians. I'm talking about the fact that in, in, in Philippians, something was emptied. So both of those can't be both true at the same time in, okay, in, a, in, a, so in a reading that I'm having. I just wanted to clarify that point. Um, so what I'm saying is that he he himself, there's a way of saying it. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly the way that, a way to say this, but. Take your time, Mike. No he, he refused to use um, his deity, right? He refused to use some of his, his divine prerogatives while he was here on earth. It would be like a, it'd be like a, and I, this might get me into trouble. But it's like a black belt, 21st degree black belt, teaching a five-year-old um, karate. Um, a 21st degree, whatever, I don't know how the high they go, could literally obliterate a five-year-old. But he, th this, this teacher bows down and gets down on the child's level, and he, and he works with that child on that level, right? Well, that's the same thing that, that Christ did. He emptied himself. He, he was God. He always has been God, but he devoided himself. He emptied himself of his divine power and attributes to a certain degree when he was here on earth. That didn't happen. Nobody had to do that to him. That's something that he he, he did on his own. He humbled so himself. Just to, just to take he your took analogy. The form of a servant. Sorry, Mike, to interrupt you. Uh, just to take yeah. your analogy. When a when a twenty uh, third degree uh, in a jiu jitsu black belt, whatever that might be, we're referring to is 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 sparring with or training maybe a child. All of their skills and everything, the set is there, okay. Mm -hmm. And yeah. what they do is they don't apply it when they're playing with that child or training that child. Yeah. So nothing has been removed from that individual. So nothing of their aspect of their knowledge or their power or their strength or their ability has been removed. I understand that. That makes perfect sense, what you're saying. The problem here is where the verse says he actually emptied himself, and you use the word emptied, which means he the, certain things were now no longer there that were there before. Otherwise, the word empty doesn't have any. It's like a glass is full and then it's empty. Something has gone. And that's really the point here. So here, either the fullness was there, the glass was full, or the glass was half full later. Something has been removed. And I'm saying that you can't have both both ways. So either the master who was 23rd down, when he fights a, a, a white belt, loses all of his knowledge uh, and, and, and is equal to that, or near enough equal to that person to not do them too much harm, or he still retains all of his power and his knowledge, but actually is, is not applying it all in that specific. So either there's an emptying or there's not an emptying. And that was really the distinction that we were trying to, or I was trying to ask about. Yeah. And that's really what I wanted your thoughts on. It would, it's interesting, and I'd like to understand your view on it. And, and I think you, I think you and I are probably pretty close to to what what I'm understanding. And, and maybe this that analogy wasn't as bad as I thought. Maybe it might have been. Um, so Jesus was God, um, but he didn't use he didn't use his divine powers um, most of the time when he was on Earth, as, especially as as a way to protect himself. Right. Um, in one of the Gospels, uh, he says that he could have called down a legion of angels to, to deliver him. Um, at, at any time, Christ had the power and the authority to totally destroy his enemies. But he didn't because he had a mission. 
His mission was to take the form of a servant like we've been like, like we've been looking at here um, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Um, the New Testament is just replete with this thought of the mission of Christ. What was mission? the mission of Christ? His, his mission was to give his life as a ransom for the many. Um, that's why that's why throughout the whole of the Gospels, everything is is focused in, and especially the, the, the last week of his life, everything is focused in on this one purpose of, of him, which was to give his life um, for um, for the sinner, right? To, to, to pay the sin debt. Um, and so, and no, I don't think there was a do sin that. debt. I, 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 I think you're, you're, you're importing that in. I don't think there was a sin but, debt. But Mike, in short, then, are you saying that, to answer Imran's question, are you saying that there was not an emptying of, of, the, of the divinity? Because he still had these divine powers and he, he didn't still, use it most of the time. Yes, I believe that he still had, he still had divinity. He was still God. I mean, I think it says, one of the creeds says that he was, um, I don't know if it says fully God and fully man, I believe. Um, he still had, he was still divine. He was still human. He had the um, the uh, hypostatic union, right? But he didn't use those, he didn't use that power um, to defend himself. He didn't use that power to... Um, so what did he empty himself of? And, and what is the proper translation then, for, so, according to you, of Philippines uh, chapter 2, verse 7? How should that be translated? Philippines 2, 7. I think it's translated the way it's supposed to be. He emptied em himself. Emptied okay, himself. So when, he was, when he was in heaven, right? When he was in heaven, the angels worshipped him. He was he was had he was the 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 son from of the father right he had he had everything there he had glory he had majesty he had he had angels bowing down before him he had all of these things going on um, is, as is as, your belief as that before he emptied himself he was already equal to God? Yes, for all so eternity. Then why does it say in verse nine because of Jesus emptying himself because of this reason? God now exalts him or raises him even higher. So if he was already equal to God, is he now even above or higher than God based upon so, verse 9? So what I what I believe about that is that when he humbled himself, what did he do? He came down to earth, he became man, right? Um he he had he went through everything that a, a human being does. You look at and the book because of, of that, he was then given a status even higher than what he had before. He was raised up from he was raised up from his human his human um you know the the level that he had gone down to, right? He humbled himself, he took the form of a servant, he gave his life, and now that he has given his life and he's he totally fulfilled the the law of God. He totally, um, he totally redeemed mankind, um, those who would put, put faith in him. Um, and then, yes, from that, from, that, from that low estate, God raised him back up um, and exalted him because he, he, he fulfilled uh, everything that was Jesus required. received the reward which he didn't have before because of that. Because no, I say... I think that when he came down to earth, and, and I haven't thought this one through, um, that's the first time I've ever had anybody ask me that, but the way I'm it's thinking actually, of this... Um, Bart Ehrman, if you read this book, um, it's by Bart Ehrman, um, where he's actually defending the existence for, of Christianity, um, sorry, the existence for Jesus. Um, mm -hmm. I forgot the name of the book now, but basically he says with regards to Philippians, um, this is like exaltation Christology, because if Jesus was already God prior to his kenosis or emptying himself, then how mm -hmm. can he now be given a status uh, which he didn't previously have? Because what could be more high than, than being God himself? So so it, it does seem that Jesus is going from one divine divine state to uh, another divine state, but it's like an elevator. And Nazim, I, I think this also connects to Ijaz's uh, point earlier on, which is that is Jesus re is he receiving the name Jesus uh, for the first time, and 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 this name Jesus yeah. is going to be above every other name, including above the name of Yahweh, or mm -hmm. is he receiving the name Yahweh now for the first time, or is he just having the name Yahweh restored to him? Did he lose the name when he emptied himself and came down? 
These, these are all the different kinds of questions. Yeah. I'm still working out with DDMT himself because uh, according to Mike, he's walking around like a 23rd degree black belt, just not using his flex. So he has, so he's still got all his power, according to what Mike believes. But then my only I question mean, is, why do you know about the fig tree? Yeah, because uh, that's what I actually wanted to ask. Why does the divine power sometimes? Um, act at the um, command of the human side of Jesus because sometimes it seems that Jesus makes a mistake um, and he's hungry and he sees the tree what appears to have something to eat and so he goes up to it and he finds nothing but pigs and so he curses it um, but the, the whole thing begins or starts out with Jesus being hungry because of his human nature but the yeah. cursing comes from his divine nature so why does the divine nature act upon the mistake of the human side. Yeah, and just, just to so support you I there, Nassim, just, just one second, Mike, just to continue that particular point, because when I speak to Christians about the fig tree, they say, oh, he emptied himself, and he gave up all his power, and he was just a man. But you're saying the opposite. You're saying I'm, he had that power. I'm saying I, he had to have had that power, right? At, at times, he, he did use his divine prerogatives. Um, I don't, I didn't ever, I don't know of anybody that ever said that he didn't, I mean, there may be other people, but that God didn't, that Jesus didn't possess divine power. Um, walking on water um, is something that, that nobody could do except for Peter, and he maybe took a couple of steps and fell. Um, you know, healing people long distances away, doing, you know, the different miracles that he did, the feeding of the 5,000, the, the feeding the of the 4,000. Well. Excuse me? The disciples did miracles as well. Um, okay. Um, that didn't what, make them God. Do what? That, that didn't, didn't make, make them, them God. God did Jesus it. never had to ask permission for any of the miracles that he did. Um, he didn't, like the prophets, you know, the prophets would pray to God and say, do, do different things or, or, you know, God would tell them to do th certain things. Um, Jesus just unilaterally did these things. Um, I know the, the fig tree, um, it's believed, and, and the way I've understood the fig tree is that the fig tree is a, is a picture of, of Israel. Yeah, but read um, fig tree in the Gospel of Mark before you start um, embellishing. Go to the Gospel of Mark, the story of the fig tree, please. Okay. It's in Mark chapter 11. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with the story. Yeah. And so what is, the, what is your point? Uh, okay, so why did he curse the fig tree? Um, if, the if, fig tree, the fig tree is a picture of Israel. Israel no, 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 no. He was hungry. Let me, let me, can I finish? The, the, um, the fig tree is a picture of Israel. Israel looked like it was doing so well, like it should have been, it should have been bearing fruit, right? Um, the beautiful temple, all of the, all of the, 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 the countermunts that went along with, with, uh, Israel and, you look at the you look at the fig tree and it looks like it should be in bloom. It looks like it should have fruit, and yet Israel didn't have fruit. Israel was about ready to kill its Messiah, um, and so uh, Jesus knew that the the, the fig tree wasn't going to have fruit. Um, he knew it. He yeah, he knew that it wouldn't have fruit. So why did one he... second, Mike? No, Mike, Mike, you're reading so much into this. Yeah, Mike, you made a statement just now that caught me off guard. You said Jesus never had to ask permission to do his miracles. So obviously I'm going to read a verse that everyone knows. It's Acts chapter 2, verse 22. It says in the NET, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man clearly attested to you by God with powerful deeds, wonders and miraculous signs that God performed among you okay. through him. So he's not the source of the miracles, God is. And we accept that. So it's not, you can't say he didn't ask permission, when obviously he could not do it of his own cognizance. He did it only by the will of God. And does Jesus not say, I can do nothing of myself but by the Father? He says that himself. So you can't make the statement, he did miracles as he in, oh, himself oh, yeah. wanted to do. Uh, and, and no, sorry. Uh, also, sorry. Ijaz, there are prophets in the Old Testament who perform miracles without first explicitly praying to God. So, for example, in Second Kings chapter four, uh, Elisha goes to the dead child and he puts his mouth on the child's mouth. Mm -hmm. He puts his eyes on the child's eyes. He prays on him and the child's skin becomes warm again. So in that instance, 
uh, Elisha didn't go out of his way to explicitly uh, verbally pray to God first. But we understand that Elisha was doing this miracle by God's power and permission. Uh, and verse 13 of Can I just so, also add to uh, give an example actually where Jesus directly does ask um, for uh, God to help him with something. That's in the raising of Lazarus. I'm sure you all know this. This is John. Uh, um, and if you read in that, we we, we, we hear that. Uh, and I think it was, in, I'm looking for the one in Luke, but I can't find it at the moment. It's um, in John, he, chapter 11. John, 11. John chapter yes. 11. John chapter 11. John chapter 11. It says, and, 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 and this is where, if you if you read the verse sort of before, for, uh, verse 41, um, Jesus says, Jesus' eyes lifted up and he, and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And uh, the following word is, I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe you have sent me. So what we see here is that Jesus, Jesus according, if we accept these words as being the words that Jesus has said, he's saying that he's always asked the Father, and he's always heard in what he says. And this is a, this is an example of Jesus asking Father to to help. Additionally, we have examples of uh, an attribute that say. Uh, for example, not knowing not knowing the hour. Uh, we know, for example, that Jesus specifically says that, that only the Father knows the hour, neither the angels nor the Son. And that he's obviously the Son would hear in Christian understanding would refer to the pre-existent, uh, pre-manifestation uh, Son, i.e. not even Jesus, but even the, the Son of the Trinity uh, knows the hour. So there seems to be this, uh, maybe a lack of the full fullness that we were talking about and i think then what we seem to be saying is the word emptying isn't the right word that to have been used in philippians and and maybe paul got it wrong or there could have been another word and the manuscript has been corrupted with that over time it's one of the two possibilities yeah i, I don't know i i think um i think the word emptied is is good it, it shows that um that christ was the one who actually did this it wasn't something that happened to him um it was something that he did on his own, um, and he took, he, he took the form of he, asked, he did it by the will of the Father, yeah? You accept what uh, Dr. Imran just said, and that uh, um, he didn't just do it. You're talking about uh, Lazarus? Okay, so, so yes. Okay, so there is times, I believe, um, where where... God wanted to, or Jesus wanted to demonstrate that him and the Father were were in uh, in tandem with each other. That that he was he was doing the will of the Father. Okay, um, so go back to your original point. So yeah. Jesus did sometimes do ask the Father permission, and you accept so that's point that the prophets of the past did miracles without as well. I would have to I would have to look more into that. Um, I'm not going to you know say one way or the other. Um, you're There's probably really example of uh, the bones of Elijah um, raising somebody from the dead. I, th I think there was a yeah. somebody dead is thrown into a grave and yeah. they come into contact with the bones of, and they come to life. So we have these sort of attributes that God has given to His prophets that they can use, and even we see a, 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 a prophet who has passed away still possessing that attribute of being able to raise someone from the dead, and it doesn't make that individual divine. So I think the I think the confusion really is really about this word emptying or not emptying, and we've got these two opposite statements in uh, Colossians and, and and Philippians, and it's interesting to hear your your take on it. Actually, it's been a really interesting conversation, yeah. and we've got a we've got a specifically a theological discussion about sin and salvation, not a historical one, which we're trying to do today, which is in two weeks' time on a Monday, on EF hour, and you're welcome to that. Um, uh, we'd love to have you there, Mike. Well, thank you. Conversation. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Hey, I ha I do have a question though. Yeah. Um, so I was sitting in the uh, in the broadcast uh, behind the stage or whatever they call it uh, while Frank was talking, and I'm just curious. Um, why do you only have one Christian on at a time? Because I was sitting there for a good I don't know twenty minutes okay. uh, waiting to. Come I, I can give you a good answer. Something. What's that? Okay. To be honest with you, we want to deal with the argument succinctly. Yeah. So okay. what we ask you to do is come on and challenge something we've said. Now, to be honest with you, the amount of Christians we have on that are not on the same page is immense. We can have you on and another Christian come on and will disagree with what you've just said. Yes, sure. Yeah, I know. Right? So to have two at the same time would be mental. So it's better to so, deal with one of you at a time. 
Okay, we're I not just bullying, we're not bullying you. We're not bullying yeah, no, you. No. We're, here, we're, we're not here as uh, eagle maniacs here. No, I'm here that. to deal with the arguments. That's all. That's yeah, all. No, and I was just wondering because I, I was thinking there was some things that Frank was saying that I wish I could have jumped in and, and helped him with. Um, and I, I think other Christians are probably doing the same thing as they're sitting in the backstage going, Oh man, I could I could probably help him out with you know, with with an understanding on this or that or. You know, things happen in real time, and you go, "Oh man, I wish I could say this, but you can't." But I understand. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. You, you guys got this platform, and you guys are in charge, and and that's fine. I, I'm okay with. Yeah, but it's not just because we're in charge. It's not just because we're in charge. Yeah. We can have two Christians with completely different views. Right. Sure. Yep. I gotcha. And who? Who? What are we dealing with? It, 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 yeah, Hamza, especially when certain books like Daniel and Revelation come mm -hmm. up, which are very uh, open to diverse interpretation, sure. it, it's very common to get two Christians start explaining that, no, 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 Revelation 3 is not talking about Islam. It's talking about the Catholic yeah. Church, and okay. you can just go on and on. But I hope, Mike, that you were given ample time to like express your views, Absolutely. or even if you wanted to clarify anything that Frank said, which you felt was left uh, unexplained. Well, I don't even remember so far I'll go up now. But no, hey guys, I appreciate it. I know I, I talked to you a couple of weeks ago. I, I, I try to get on and, and uh, I keep ending up having problems and having to leave and come back and, and different things. So I appreciate the time and I appreciate talking to you guys. Always a pleasure. Take care, Mike. Guys, take, take care, Mike. Mike. Thank you. So I think that's really good. Uh, it's interesting because we actually have had multiple Christians before in the past. We've had three people in a row. And exactly what you said, Brother Tadda and, and, and Hamza, what happens is they actually end up disagreeing with each other. And it's almost like it seems unfair almost to allow this to happen because whatever points any individual is going to make, it doesn't really come across clearly. And I, and I agree, Brother Tadda, we try and be as fair and we allow the conversation to happen. And we're just having a conversation. We're not trying to browbeat anybody at all um and so if people think that that's the way it's coming across the feedback's appreciated and, and maybe we can if if someone's in the background and raises their hand and we can see that maybe we can bring them on for that point if they want to sort of contribute in fact uh, dr Amman, i think the only way to make it fair would be to uh, filter and make sure that there's only three reformed calvinists on at the same time or <laughs> you know, two Southern Baptists on at the same time. And I, yeah. I don't think we have that yeah. much selection to yeah. choose from. And uh, the problem is though, Mike went down a road that he was just going to get jumped on from every single angle. He, 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 you know, he already messed up with the emptying and the fulfillment. And then he started saying, oh, well, Jesus didn't have the permission. Then the disciples, then you came with the prophets of the past, having miracles without. So it's like, and then, then of course, if he's, if he's got Jesus walking around like he's a, a God, but not showing it off, then you've got the problem with the fig tree because Christians defend the fig tree with that he's got no power. He's given, he's emptied himself. As soon as I mentioned that to any Christian about the fig tree, they say, oh, he emptied himself. And they'll quote Philippians. But, but the useful you know, thing about that conversation was we, we took him through his thought process and one by one showed where that it's not quite adequate to answer the question. And he did, he did try. So he, he thought, okay, this isn't right. I need to rephrase this. And then he tried something else. And then, and that was really good because hopefully that process will continue afterwards and then he'll have to sort of sit down and maybe reconcile for himself how i'm going to approach this in the future because it's going to get raised again because brothers and sisters are watching and they'll learn from this That's and it. they can use these arguments in future discussions inshallah i mean when he made that point about god dwelling in him and all of a sudden said so that is on him and what the father in him the whole trinity is inside him now Actually, I'm cognizant of the fact that he's the lone Christian on, which is why I didn't throw all my Christians, uh, all my questions, sorry, at him at once. And I'm sure you guys were holding back at times as well, too, because, for example, I mean, he, he said Jesus possessed all the attributes of God. Well, is being a trinity, is, is that an attribute of God? Uh, and if it's not, then does he agree with us that being a trinity is not one of the attributes of God? So uh, it's 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 very complex. It is very complicated. You know? I mean, if, if if he tweaked it and said attributes of the Father, mm. it's a bit more, you know. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's like when when Christians in the beginning said God uh, was in the beginning was a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And my question is, who's the word? Because God is a Trinity already. Who's the word? <laughs> the word's with God. I thought God's already comprised of three. So, mm. it, it, the word God messes everything up for them. To be honest. If you, if I you was waiting finish. for Brother Hamza to ask him, uh, why do you believe that a statement to be true 
you know, the Colossians statement about um, it pleased God the fullness of day to dwell in, in him. Even if it does say what it what he means it to say, why does he believe that statement to be true in the first place? Just because Listen, it's in the he's already told us he believes the New Testament is historical and it's reliable mm. source. And we, we, we can't go over the, all the old ground of why we don't believe it. So we have to just kind of do a nasm <laughs> and roll with the word verses <laughs> and just use the yeah. verses with, with them. Because even the verses that they're trying to use don't support what they're saying. Because I, I yeah. did this with a Christian the other day. Um, I had a, 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 he was a Brazilian Pentecostal, some weird mm. kind of church. And um, he, he was collapsing under this scrutiny. So, so I, when I was challenging the concept of the Trinity, I was going after the Holy Spirit, and, and, mm. I, and I was basically saying to him, "Look, it, does the Holy Spirit have all knowledge?" And he was like, "Well, um, no, right." And does God have all knowledge? Uh, uh, yeah, right. So the Holy Spirit can't be God, then, can it? Because mm. it, it, if it's lacking in something, it's not God, is it? And and, and he, he wanted me to go to Jesus and emptying himself and all this business, but yeah. I went after the Holy Spirit, and it just completely collapsed the Trinity just from that angle without even mm. mes- mentioning it. So the problem I explained to him is your your um, doctrines of Christianity don't marry up with what the Bible says. Mm. So you're you're claiming that the Holy Spirit is part of God, part of your creed, and yet in the Bible it's saying he doesn't know the time of the hour, therefore he can't yeah. be God. So what's wrong here now? Your creed or the Bible? And at the same time, in this Pentecostal kind of church, they believe the Bible's inerrant. <laughs> so it's like, oh, come on, <laughs> now you're stuck. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, the New Testament doesn't marry up with with no one, um, neither Muslim nor uh, Trinitarian. Uh, but the difference is that Muslims are not inerrantists of the Bible. So we, we accept that, you know, like Paul, for example, was an fide apostle of Christ. Um, uh, once you start accepting that, then it makes it more easy to see, uh, you know, Jesus wasn't God, but he was a, a messenger, a prophet of God, as Islam teaches us. In the Pentecostal church in particular, I mean, there, there's a reliance on gifts uh, of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of tongues and so forth. And so perhaps, uh, and it would be great if a Pentecostal came on and, and explained and clarified to us, but it seems to yeah. me as if uh, scriptural proofs for the divinity of the Holy Spirit is not as important. It's it's more experiential because that church feels that they, they experience the gifts of the Holy Spirit all the time. Yeah, um, but what he, he did start with that, but then I explained to him how by me praying to Allah, wondrous things have happened in my life. So I know you're saying I have truth because wondrous things happen in my life. Of course not. Mm-hmm. So we can't use that as a standard of criterion for truth. Because mm-hmm. you know, when I when I went to get married, I prayed to Allah every day, ended up getting in after three months in Morocco getting married, alhamdulillah. But I prayed for that thing. Now I can and they could say, Oh, I prayed because he gave me some example of some uh, event that occurred. And he believed God was responsible for what happened. Well, I believe Allah was responsible for what happened for me. But it's not a standard of truth or a criterion for truth. So even if they want to go with that, they still need to hold on to something. Mm. So the problem he had, I took apart the Trinity from one end. end then I took apart the reliability of the, the Gospels from another end. And then I collapsed his experience as well. So now he's, now he's thinking about things. I mean, it must be pretty tough being a Pentecostal Christian being born in Brazil. When it's all Catholic around you, do you know what I'm saying? It must be mental. And um, it's a particular church. It's called Christo something. I don't know. But they believe in the inerrancy of the Bible. And once you've got that as your pinnacle of, and the premise of your faith, you're in trouble. Have you guys had any experience speaking to binatarians? Because I spoke to at least. I, I mean, I, I actually had a debate discussion, uh, you know, with a binatarian, someone who believes that it's just the Father and the Son that are the two persons of the Godhead and they don't consider the Holy Spirit to be a, a separate person of the Godhead. I don't know if well, you guys have had this into the bus. <laughs> yeah. I think that there's a new set of problems, don't it? How do you know what canon of scripture is now? Yeah. yeah. Thomas, that must have been a fascinating discussion, Brother Sadao. Yeah, it was yeah. the debate that I had on Takia, you know, does God oh, permit really? lying? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So okay. that gentleman that I debated with, Pastor, his name yeah. Adrian Davis. Yeah, late, towards the end of the debate, I think we explore that 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 fact that he believes, he doesn't believe in the Trinity, he believes in, in binatarianism. Yeah. Gosh. Right. It's, it seems all the Christians have run for the hills. Should we allow Muslims on to ask some Dawah questions and things? I think we should, and then uh, we can, because I can see that Brother Ijaz, mashallah, his laptop is probably 
about to explode with the heat. No. Uh, allow the, um... I'm using my second laptop because the first one I think has actually died. I'm just going to be honest with you. We were about to go live on SC Davo. Yusha Evans turns up. And uh, I think uh, the admin says, let's go live, boys. I say, yes, dead. I had to run and <laughs> get everything <laughs> last night. But alhamdulillah, we're still alive at the moment. Uh, and I, I found that conversation very uh, interesting with Frank and uh, the other chap that was on. What's his name again? Mike? Very, Mike. very unique. Very yeah. unique. Very unique names. I have to mention that right now. But um, uh, it, it's interesting because when I've debated with Trinitarians in the past, they've always like held on to these verses as some kind of evidence of Trinitarian truth. And it took us a few minutes to point out why it wasn't. And this just goes to show the audience the best like argument you can use is to take your argument is to take your opponent's greatest evidence and then show how it actually works in your favor and that's what we've done today right that's why you would realize so many christians are uncomfortable to come and speak with us on philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 11. if you read trinitarian commentaries i know that the brothers here can confirm this they emphasize these verses so much yet the details that we've gone into Brothers, we've taken them from different commentaries and we've laid a case that I do not think can be refuted. I remember Paul is meant to be writing this towards the end of his career because he likely died or is beheaded in the year 65 and between the year 60 and 62 he writes this letter. So this is a very somber letter in one sense but it's also very aggressive yet the theology in it seems to be very confused if not conflicted and so it, I was looking very much forward to seeing if Trinitarian Christians would turn up in their droves to use this against us. But I think they've kind of understood that uh, we're, a bit, we're a bit better read than we look, right? We yeah. might look like this, but we read, trust me, we've got books. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it amaz amazed me today, actually, that it's really been highlighted that every Christian I've ever seen preaching on any street corner must be reading the NASB Bible, every one of them. Every knee because the bow. NIV and the KJV says every knee should bow. But yes. every time I hear these Christians preaching, every knee will bow or shall bow. Well, that's only in one translation. So what, <laughs> they, they, they just read a, a translation to suit their... Uh, but I, I don't even, they even know it. I think they think the KJV no. says every knee will bow. No. And then they look and they go, oh, wait a minute, it should bow. And maybe it's the NIV. They go to NIV, oh, it's not there either. I, re I, remember, I remember a few years ago because... Everywhere you go, you'll see this verse, and Christians use it as a trump card. You might not like Jesus now, but you will, right? And uh, they, you know, they always pull it out in their debates with us. And I remember going through the uh, Gospel of John, and I came out, sorry, uh, uh, reading, reading Philippians a few years ago, and I noticed a variant, and I'm like, wait a second, have I? Has it been saying shall all along? Like, did I misremember? So I went and looked <laughs> at a bunch of translations, and I'm like, Huh, it doesn't actually say that. So I went up and I, I think I joined a Greek forum uh, for New Testament scholars and I was asking, what does this mean? And they broke it down. They gave me a few book references. I checked out the references and I'm like, what? So it's like it's like how many Christians, uh, you know, it's kind of like when we say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, and we take it to mean uh, in the name of God the most gracious, the most merciful, and then you come across someone that says in the name of God the most gracious, the most compassionate. Right? We we tend to know one more than the other. So I think on the pulpit they they, they emphasize every knee will bow without realizing, hey, that's not the case. So it's part of Christian tradition. It's just not part of Christian scripture. And that's the difference. So you'll only get this kind of content on EF Dawa, the number one speaker's corner Dawa channel on YouTube. I know <laughs> I'm not paid to say that. <laughs> uh, follow of Jesus. Um, yeah, chat. we spent a lot, a lot of time discussing the second chapter, the Philippians hymn. And um, it's interesting to look at some other points as well from Olympians as well, such as the Perusia or the Second Coming. Um, it appears that Paul now uh, begins to believe that Jesus wouldn't return within his own lifetime, probably. But what, what verse are you looking at in chapter three, brother? Now, um, I was looking at like uh, Philippians chapter one, verse twenty-three, and also chapter three, oh. verse eleven. 
where Paul now believes that he he may die, and if he does die, then he will be with Christ in the afterlife. Yes, yes, I read that earlier. Yeah, it, it, it's peculiar because he says, uh, "I don't want to leave you." Uh, but it is greater for me to be with Christ, to be in communion with mm -hmm. Christ. But then he says, I have to stay in the flesh because it is better for you. As if he's trying to give an explanation that he's delaying for them. But the truth is his life and death is in the hands of God, not in his own mm -hmm. hands. So it's, it's very peculiar to, to say the least. Uh, someone is asking in the chat, will we allow a Christian to come on? Yes, we will allow any polytheist like Anthony Rogers to join us. Definitely. As long as he can promise to keep it simple and he can promise to keep it civil. I know that as a friend of David Wood, he may not be able to do so, but we do welcome any and all Christians on our stream, including David Wood. If he's if he wants to come into the lion's den, he will get bitten, but we do invite him nonetheless. And by the lion's den, I mean calling Christians. Thank you. No? No, Hamza? No? Okay. It would be nice to have Anthony on. I, and and and, and for those who don't know, like Anthony Rogers, like he, he's a veteran Christian debater, and he's he's welcome mm. to come on. But if you're just a, if you're just a regular Christian, you don't, again, you don't have to feel intimidated. We're not going into debate. Sure, we're yeah, of course. Ready to have yeah. nice conversations. Yeah. Well, well, I I admire the scholarship of Anthony Rogers because um, he says that when we say "Qulhu Allahu Ahad," the actual word is "Ahadun," and "Ahadun" means one of. So, I mean, I was blown away by his mastery of, uh, of Arabic grammar to point out that major, major variant in the Quran. You know, he, uh, I, I was so swayed and impressed by his mastery of uh, <laughs> the Arabic language. <laughs> of course, he's welcome to come on. But yeah, but that's the kind of argument that we come across. And uh, he's been saying that one for years. I just thought I'd throw, throw it out there. Um, yeah. Has but, anyone seen Samuel Green since the streamy came on? Yeah, I spoke. I spoke to him a few days ago, actually. Oh, okay. Um, he's alive and well, alhamdulillah. You know the oh, pandemic. Jonathan McClatchy, man. I thought COVID might have got him. Who? Got Jonathan McClatchy. Oh, I think he died. Um, uh, at least his arguments did. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> Those okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't say things like that, bro. His arguments died. Come on now. Uh, yeah, so if, if there are no Christians in the background, I'm not sure they are. Let me see. The uh, no, red pen is a Muslim. But what okay, I say, so let Muslims on, and then if a Christian does come in, we'll give them preference. It's okay, something is pretty strange. We have someone called follower of Jesus saying, Ijaz, please don't add me to the chat. I'm so confused by this. Yeah, yeah, I, I kicked him out of the back chat. What I, I do think Ijaz, you, you and Hamza perhaps are running away from an argument here, and 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 that is Nazim's argument, which he's brought up twice now, which oh. is that uh, is is Paul now doubting the second coming of Jesus within his lifetime because he he seems to be anticipating that he's getting closer and closer to his death, mm. or did we did we kind of just touch on that now anyhow? No, we, we can continue to touch on it. The, the, so yes, Brother Nazim's if argument. If you compare that vis -a -vis to like his first letter to the Thessalonians in chapter four, verse eleven, um, which is regarded as being his like earliest letter in the New Testament, um, there he expects Jesus to return in his own lifetime because he says, "We who are alive and remain on the earth." Whereas Philippians is like one of his mm -hmm. last letters. And there, yeah. um, it seems like um, he's now expecting that he will probably die now and see Jesus in the next life. So, so all the advice he gave to people about not getting married if you weren't married. Mm. And, you know, yeah, that's a uh, good point. Yeah, that, that must seem as because that's what he was saying that if don't even slave, bother doing these slave, things slave, because don't mm, start a business, don't get married. And now he's at the end of his life. And he's thinking, well, actually, maybe I've got this wrong. And if that's the case, was then where was it actually yeah. divine inspiration? It, like sacred or? text or yeah. sacred scripture. And uh, does he apologize to those poor people who didn't get married <laughs> and are now past <laughs> the age of marriage? Yeah. <laughs> can, can you imagine? Or, you know, I, I, um, I, I don't identify with this, but can you imagine one, being one of those single people who's not yet married and your religious leader comes to <laughs> and he's like, don't worry, because the world is going to end. You'll get all you need in Jannah. 
And then like 20 years later, he's like, yeah, about that, uh, don't <laughs> wait. I'm going to tell you, <laughs> you, you shouldn't have listened to me. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. <laughs> what do you do then? Because think about it. Can, can you be more evil than denying someone the opportunity to get married and having kids or, or having a family life? Remember, Christians argue that the family unit is the bedrock of civilization. And Paul is over there saying, eh, don't need to come. You don't need to get married. Uh, but I mean, come to marriage, to be clear. Uh, Quirty, we would welcome anyone. We don't discriminate. We All we ask is that he does not beat women and that he is respectful. That's about it. If he wants to steal charity money as the... So he's, he's, he's saying Sam Shimon is going to come on and defend the New Testament. Is that, is that what he's saying? Well, he keeps asking one by one about everyone, but none of them seem to be here. So Quirty... Mm. Quirty, we don't discriminate, right? I mean, we have Liverpool supporters on the panel, for God's sake. So anyone is... A, a, oh, my God, I meant United. Sorry, Dr. Iman, I meant United supporters. I'm really, really sorry. Oh, don't, worry <laughs> don't worry about us, mate. Don't worry about us. Ticking along. Oh, my goodness. I'm All right, out. so... Oh. You've, you've, you've sparked Anna's off in the in the chat. <laughs> I've realized. You know what I'm not seeing today? I'm not seeing Christians in the chat either, you know that. I'm looking, I'm reading the chat, I'm looking for the Christian, you know, usually hiding around. They're not even there. They're, they're probably watching Wood's stream because of uh, some Oh, fair enough. Oh, yeah, fair enough, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. All yeah, right, so yeah. Red Pen, I believe, is a Muslim. Uh, Salam alaikum, bro. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. How are you doing, brothers? Um, Alhamdulillah. Um, I just Kalam to the da'wa. and um, I really have like an open question I want to ask Christians in general because I always uh, I have a debate for many of them so Christian thinks when we do that kind of um, discussion and debate with them they think we are attacking them I want them to ask themselves we Muslim we don't have David Wood or Tommy Robinson that mock Jesus or God well, they do have. And also, every time I expose many who claim to be Muslim, but at the end they become, uh, I find that they are Christians. So we don't see that Muslim do that when they want to debate Christians. I want them to ask themselves these questions. Also, we respect Jesus. There's no one Muslim will be considered Muslim if he not believe in Jesus as a prophet and respect Jesus. Christian um, at, um, insult Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and insult Allah. And one thing they don't know when we say Allah, uh, Arab Christians, they don't say God. They don't have the word God. They said Allah. They don't know that Allah is also means God. So I want them to think why we are doing that. If they believe that they have the Holy Spirit with them and they want to debate why they are using all these tricks. Many of them, they came to me and they said, oh, I'm an ex-Muslim. I'm a Muslim. And it's easy, you know, to expose him. One of them, I asked him, okay, when you are fasting in Ramadan and doing uh, Al-Hajj, can you do both? He said, well, it depends. Now then I expose him that he's not a Muslim. So I said, why are you doing that? Yeah, and there are many of them. So I don't see Muslim do that. And I have one question, if you can ask Christian to answer that question. They believe Jesus came and died for our sin. So... Are those who killed Jesus will go to heaven? Yeah, that's my question. Well, they, and, they, do, they do believe that um, anyone who accepts the gift of Christ's sacrifice goes to heaven. But if you die without accepting Christianity, that is accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then he did not actually die for your sins. As in the sins have been died for, but you don't get the benefit of it. It's a lot like if someone... Uh, pays off for a new car for you, but they never give you the keys to drive it because you've never asked them for the keys in the first place, if, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, but I mean, what, what would happen for those? I mean, what's going to happen for those who kill Jesus? Are they go to heaven? Yeah, that's my question to he, Christians. He passed it. He passed yeah. it. I, I think, I, I mean, I think Ajaz answered it. I mean, look, e even in our religion, mm -hmm. right? Even in our religion, somebody who uh, committed a major sin, committed murder or killed, uh, let's say, I mean, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was not killed, but it, somebody who killed uh, Sahaba of the Prophet, if that person later were to declare the Shahada and become a Muslim, we believe that their previous sins would be forgiven. 
So I think I think similarly in Christianity, if one of those Roman centurions later on were to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, then Christians would say that yes, even that Roman centurion who is well, responsible for spearing Jesus, yeah. Yeah, well, but he can be forgiven. Their 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 own idea that they said even if you stole candy, that consider a big sin, you will go to hell. So this is a big difference. So killing Jesus is um, something that uh, forgive you for, and stealing a candy is a big sin, or you carrying Adam's sin forever. So this is something I can't, these two things cannot come, I mean, together. And my final questions. Oh, come on, uh, that was your question, man. I, I think we see it that way. Most Muslims see it that way. That that stealing candy versus killing a prophet are not on the same level. <laughs> like killing a prophet, <laughs> major sin. You can repent for it, but it's a major sin. And stealing candy would presumably be a smaller exactly, sin. Exactly. But but but, but, but many of the Christians. The yeah, but many of the Christians that we speak to, Red Pen, uh, you'll see that one of their common sayings is that a sin is a sin is a sin, meaning that. It doesn't matter whether you committed murder or adultery or whether you told one lie in your life when you were in grade four. But if you don't repent for that uh, lie that you said in grade four, then by default, you are deserving of the condemnation of God because you yeah. are a sinner and etc. cetera. But and killing Jesus is a salvation. You see that? You see how is that different? Killing Jesus is a salvation. Mm. What I, I don't get the point of the last bit. I mean, they said Jesus came to earth to die for our sin. Yes. Yeah. How did he die? On yeah, the necessary yeah. But 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 uh, yeah, but they, they, they would have killed I mean it's funny now I'm being an apologist for Christianity here, yeah. <laughs> but they, they I think they would say that yes, the, the, the Roman centurions killed Jesus, but but they didn't kill salvation. In fact, his dying on the cross is the means of salvation for Christians. So a better question that I, I mean, a more interesting question that I like to ask is that if you lived during the time of Jesus, would you have <laughs> rescued him from the cross? Would you have rescued him from the Romans? Because then you are actually mm. preventing the means of salvation, which is his death on the cross. Uh, so if it was, uh, you know. And in fact, probably Judas was um, probably exactly. the, the most facilitating in allowing the salvation to happen by giving him up to the centurions. Um, fascinating way of thinking mm. about it, my brother just said that. Just like, okay. You know, the, the funny thing about it is because Judas died, we don't get to hear from him. But I can imagine that if, if people were making fun of him, he would literally say, it's because of me your sins got paid for. Like, why are you here to me? And the funny thing is, it is possible that the other disciples could have been jealous if the Christian narrative is true, that this is the man that did it. He got both money and praise. Let's kill him. So I don't actually know. But uh, I would like to see a movie. Have you guys seen The Life of Brian? No. By Monty Python? Nazan, what? <laughs> You've not, you seen, not seen it? No. But you have to watch the life of Brian. Can we call up the Queen and revoke a citizen? <laughs> it's like it's a foundational like British film. Nasim, are you yeah. British? I, I need to ask. Are you British? No. Well, you know what people say? People try to say it mocks Jesus, but it doesn't. No. no. It mocks yeah, Christianity. Sure. yeah. 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 It mocks Christianity because even he's trying to say I'm not the Messiah, and the people are just yeah. saying. <laughs> yeah, he's the Messiah. Yes. Because only uh, the true was it? Only the true Messiah will not claim to be the Messiah. Exactly. Okay, I'm not the Messiah. He is. He is the Messiah. No one is good but God alone. Oh, he's claiming to be God. Same thing. So I would like to see. A, I would like to see a Judas version of the life of Brian. I, but if, if someone can call up Terry Gilliam right now and ask that of him, I would pay for that movie myself. I would fund it. In any case, brother Sadat, you were saying? No, I was actually. Uh... I was actually done. I, I mean, I was just thinking about, because you mentioned Judas. Sorry, you mentioned Judas. And uh, on SC Dawa the other day, we were discussing the, I know we're going off topic here a bit, but we're talking about the Quran prophesying that Abu Lahab will die as a non-Muslim. And, and of course, uh, he, you know, he, he, he did die as a non-Muslim. Judas is kind of the opposite in that, because in the, in the sense that um, in, 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 in Matthew 19, um, most people understand that to mean that Jesus is indicating that uh, the 12 disciples will be sitting on thrones, you know, next to God. And, and is Judas supposed to be included in that? Because, because Judas backstabs Jesus, so he shouldn't be on one of these thrones, right? 
Anyhow, just thinking out loud. Or maybe he should be, because if it wasn't for him, Christ wouldn't have died, mm. according to the Christian narrative. <laughs> Chrissy, tell all your bosses we're here every Sunday, and you and they're welcome. Okay, anyone you like, bring your David Woods, bring your Sam Shimon, bring your James Whites, bring whom you like. We're here. We're waiting. I would just like to make a very brief announcement regarding Hassan Shimon. If you are a user on Discord and you're under the age of 16, we are in the process, well, me and a couple of other Muslims, we are receiving affidavits from Muslim kids that have received some very inappropriate messages from Hassan Shamoon. So if you know his account is answering Islam on Discord and you are under the age of 16, please ask your parents' permission to reach out to a legal representative so that you can sign an affidavit with their permission about the inappropriate messages he has sent you. This information will be used, inshallah, for a very serious purpose. So we're asking one and all. We already have two to three affidavits already in the bag. So this is very important, at least for me and several others. Uh, we, we don't like children being taken advantage of, and especially older men like him sending very, very inappropriate messages. And by inappropriate messages, I think you all know what I mean. So let's continue, inshallah, with the stream. So Kurti, I invite him on, because guess what? I'm going to read one of the affidavits for him. All right, let's continue, inshallah. All right, Red Pen, thanks for your questions. Take care, buddy. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Malik, how are you, bro? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, brothers. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes, we can. So, uh, regarding Philippians, um, I, I have two quick points on uh, regarding Philippians. Um, uh, number one, uh, is, isn't that, like, uh, at least in my interaction with one Jehovah's Witness, that's used as one of the proof texts um, of their belief that... Uh, Jesus was the first created being of God and essentially was an angel who emptied himself of this divine power that he had so that he could fulfill the mission of this um, uh, substitutionary atonement, right? Uh, so that's one. And uh, number two, this is actually one of the things when I was an atheist um, and um had to reject the atheistic belief because of, you know, the, the illogical nature of it and became a theist. Um, I decided to renew my interest in reading scriptures. And uh, I remember reading this, you know, that, you know, somebody is a hundred percent God and a hundred percent man. I mean, it's not biblical, but you know, it's um, part of the belief system. And uh, I remember looking out my window and seeing a squirrel and the thought came to my mind 100% squirrel and 100% god like and really the significance of that of you know god emptying himself and becoming a creature of the earth is that the nature of truth is that it's in conflict with everything else and if i was to accept it from a christian perspective that god emptied himself and entered creation as a creature of the earth, is there any logical grounds on which I should reject Hinduism, which says the same thing, right? The difference really is that in Hinduism, God empties himself and becomes a creature of the earth many times, as opposed to just that one single time. Um, so I, I I was hoping you uh, you brothers could could because like I could not find a logical reason that if I was to accept that God came to Earth as a Jew two thousand years ago, then just on first principle before reading any scripture at all, I can't logically reject that the same God incarnated in the same manner as Rama, Krishna, Ganesh, um, you know uh, Hanuman, and and so on and so forth. I mean, that point is a really powerful one, that I, and I've had that in discussions before, in that how are we limiting the persons of the, you know, the incarnation to just Jesus, or even just to three, uh, how, three persons in the, in the Godhead? That's an arbitrary number that's applied. There's nowhere that we can pull that out from. And actually, you can, like, just as you said, we can apply that to other 
religions that believe in incarnations of God on earth because they believe in Brahma and then everyone else is a essential incarnation on the earth of that being. So they have basically a Godhead of, you know, uh, uh, however, a, a million entity, however that word would be. And, and it would be the same concept. There wouldn't really be anything that much different to it. And it is an arbitrary stopping at three um, that the Christians have. So you know, I agree with you 100%. And the squirrel example, although it's, it may come across as offensive, is there a creature that you can compare to God without that being offensive? A human being compared to God would be the same as a, an amoeba compared to a human being. I mean, you couldn't really make any comparison with anything. When, when we talk, when we give them Tao, we say, you know, God is not a tree, he's not a river, he's not a star, he's not the moon, he's not a man, he's not a woman, he's not a... And we would go through all of these things because they're all nothing compared to the creator. So uh, I hope people don't take that in the wrong way, but the point is a powerful one. Jazakul Yeah, yeah sorry. Malik, I, I, sorry, go ahead, please. please. Yeah, no, you can go ahead, brother. So that I'll take it after you. No, I just want to say, yeah, that's that's a great point, brother Malik, and, and I agree with you. And I just want to add that you know th th there is a racial element to this discussion too, in the sense that if I was racial or tribalistic in my thinking, then uh, one of the first questions I would ask is why did God choose to empty Himself and take on the image of a Palestinian Jewish man, like? you know, why not an Indian man? Like, you know, what's wrong with me, right? And uh, so Rama and Hinduism kind of kind of help remedy or, or solve that problem. In other words, you know, why didn't God come down as a black man? Why didn't he become a white man? Why didn't he become a Chinese man? Uh, or better yet, we could ask in this day and age, you know, why a man? Why not a woman? Perhaps as a woman, he would have experienced, you know, the the entirety or the fullness of the life cycle in a different kind of way. So alhamdulillah, Islam avoids these complications altogether and says, Allahu akbaru min kulli shay. Allah is greater than every conceivable thing. He's He's greater than a man or a woman or a bird or a tree or an Arab or a non-Arab or a Jew or a Gentile. He's the one that created these things. You know, And that makes much more sense to me. SubhanAllah. Profound point. Uh, it, it's, uh, when I was, um, when, when I, because like I have, my, my ancestors are from the Indus Valley, right? They, you know, in, in, in that essence, I am a Hindu, right? And I imagine that if um, a Christian missionary, let's say a thousand some years ago, right? Before I knew of, before that culture, you know, um, uh, before Muslims went there um, and a Christian missionary came along and said, well, look, God incarnated in Palestine, I think my reaction immediately would be, oh, let's, let's include Jesus in the list. Um, let me tell you how many times God incarnated to us. It, you know, like that, that would be the natural reaction. And then I would use as proof text uh, in the Gita where um, uh, it's either Lord Shiva or Lord Krishna says to Arjun, whenever the earth is full of corruption and evil, I incarnate myself. Hmm. So, so ju just to respond to an earlier point that you made, Brother Malik. Uh, uh, so, it, I'm going to pivot off of something that Dr. Imran, whom I sometimes very love, love very much, um, he mentioned that uh, it's an arbitrary thing to stop at three, and I agree with you. See, nowhere in the Old or the New Testament does it limit the number of persons in the Godhead. So, we tend to think of it as a trinity, but there's a difference between only three persons being mentioned and the possibility of more than three existing overall. So, for example, if you read the New Testament, you will never find the phrase monothreis, only three. You will find that it mentions Father, Son, and Spirit, but it just mentions that same thing like in the Old Testament. It never mentions that there is, a, like, you don't get the sense from the Hebrew Bible that there is God the Son, that is going to become incarnate, that is going to live among you. You don't get that sense. And so via the idea of progressive revelation, if you can move from one person and one being to three persons and one being, why can't you have four persons and one being in the next iteration, right? There is no limit. And what they say is, well, it won't happen because, well, you know, the age of prophecy has come to an end. And I say to them, in the same way that you think the Jews have been blinded when they read the Hebrew Bible, I used to say that you're not blinded in reading the New Testament. 
right? And there was another point to this as well. Christians believe in something known as a, as a theophany, as an appearance of God. So he does not actually have to take on flesh to come to earth, but he can appear in different forms. He can appear as a non-binary gendered person if he wanted by the Christian metric, right? So, so why doesn't that happen? See, God has no restriction, uh, at least in the Christian faith, that he cannot appear to you now. So, you know, when Christians tell you pray and there'll be an answer, some Christians pray and they see that they see Jesus. But why do none of them pray and see the Holy Spirit? Because he can appear as a theophany. Why can't he appear as an image of God on the earth? Because if he could appear as a dove or like a dove, descendant like a dove at the baptism of Jesus, then he should also be able to take on a corporeal form. So you have all these ifs, ands, and buts, but at the end of the day, Christians place arbitrary limits because they're uncomfortable with the kind of worms that they open up. So technically speaking, a Christian cannot say that Ganesh is not an, a, a, a theophany, an appearance of God. Because they can simply say the Hindus got it wrong, but it was actually you know, one of the members of the Trinity or a different member of the, of the Godhead altogether. Just added to that, I want to answer this question here, but first, before I answer to that, you know the, the, the verse in First John 5, 7, there are three of us in heaven, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, okay. But the real one, it says, there are three, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. Who's mm -hmm. the water? And who's the, the blood? Water. The living huh? water and the blood of life. Huh? So this has nothing to do with the Trinity? No, it has nothing to do with the Trinity. There are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're going to do it. Oh. Nothing. And, and that thing I just put up, see someone here now is trying to defend Paul, saying that Paul... Yeah, Paul I wanted to actually reply. Oh, yeah. Because the person was <laughs> saying that, that we were lying. <laughs> and it's like, um, but... Yeah. On, in Philippians, which we're reading, Paul mocks yep. those who are circumcised. Mm. So I don't know how this little reckless badger would reconcile that. You're welcome to come on, mate. We're waiting. Go on, Nazim. You, you answer it now more succinctly and academically. So I, I was just like, the Noahi law didn't include circumcision. Um, the, um, circumcision like begins with Abraham. Like um, it's in the book of Genesis. Um, you know, Abraham like command like he's given this commandment of circumcising every male in his household. Um, and obviously Abraham came chronologically after Noah. Uh, so the Noah law doesn't include circumcision. No, but he's not saying that in this comment. He's saying Paul circumcised Timothy. No, because... he's saying Paul circumcised a young Christian Jew because he was yeah, a I'm... Jew. And okay. he must have believed that Noah laws apply to the pagans, so the Noahite laws about the uh, sacrifice animals and all that business. But in Galatians, mean... doesn't, doesn't Paul say yeah. in Galatians that there is no Jew or Greek and you're all mm. one in Christ? So then what happens to that? Is there a two-tier system or is there just one system? He's referring, he's referring, he's referring to ethnicity, <laughs> not religion in that case. And in that specific case, it's about ethnicity, not specifically about religion. In that one specifically, though. Yeah, but, he, the but then he, in Christians, he's mocking Jews yeah. for being circumcised. It's worthless. That's exactly so the person who put get, this comment yeah. out is trying to defend Paul that Paul, yeah, said Jews should remain as Jews. Yet we're in Philippians, he's mocking that idea. That's all I mm, want to point out. That's a good point, yeah. Um, his, his, his. Um, so before I drop off, could you brothers just address the, the first point that I made in your opinion? Is Philippians, um, the, the concept of Jesus emptying himself um, of his previous nature, um, does that, in your opinion, seem more consistent with the Jehovah's Witness view of Jesus being the first created being who uh, emptied himself of, of divine attributes? essentially an angel um, emptying himself um, after creating the earth, right? Because he's the vessel through which God created uh, in John, in the beginning, in the prologue of John. Um, if you couple those things together, is, is Philippians here more uh, in line with the Jehovah's Witness uh, uh, view? Hmm. I, I think it is. But sorry, Brother Ijaz, what's your opinion? No, no, no. I, I, I disagree here because if you have to focus on the word empty. What can God empty himself of? Because God's attributes don't come and go, right? So see what they what some Christians argue is that he he empties himself of the uh, of the not the power itself, but the using of the power, the activities of God.
So the other persons continue with the activities, but he, Christ, is not consciously using his attributes and powers. Obviously, that is not true because you find it throughout the New Testament. He does do miracles and whatnot. In reality, I think what, what it should mean uh, from a Trinitarian perspective, rather, is that he empties himself, or rather the human Jesus is emptied of his personhood, and the divine Jesus enters into that personhood. Why do I say that? Is because the Christians, when they comment on this verse, at least in the Orthodox uh, study comment series, they refer to something known as anhypostasis. So they look at it as he made himself empty or he made himself nothing because he took on an empty vessel, basically, if that makes sense. That's why they believe that Christ is one person, not two, because there was no human person of Jesus that existed. So if I was to simplify it, like you think that the, uh, this part of Philippians is more consistent with the Trinitarian uh, view or or the uh, no 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 neither just, just, neither just where it says he did not think of equality of, uh, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling. To. I think the thing to learn from this, uh, brother Malik, is that Christians or Jehovah, be they Jehovah's Witnesses or be they you know the the Christians that we've had on, will look at these things with their spectacles of their particular point of view, and they will read into the text wherever they feel they need to to justify it. And now we've looked into the same thing. We've tried to analyze it and show actually a lot of this is virtually consistent with whatever even Muslims would say about the return of Jesus based upon him. And so that it's it's an imposed position when it comes to Trinitarianism or Binitarianism or, or Jehovah's Witness perspective of an angel becoming, because there's no mention of angels, there's no mention of yeah, these sorts of things within that. It's just, but you, if you want to use it as a proof text for that perspective, you probably could. And that's probably the thing. So you're never going to be able to... Uh, because we don't, we wouldn't agree with their position, but I'm sure so they could use it. it, it it's like, it's a lot like tofu, uh, brother. You can flavor it any way that you want, and that makes it difficult to like pin down what it actually means. It's so ambiguous. I'm just going to be honest. When we started off the, at the start of the stream, that's why I read from the different translations because you can read a and not a at the same time in this verse. The law of non-contradiction does not exist for it. So I'm. Um, that's simply what it is, brother. It's too ambiguous to say that no particular group can use it. It's ambiguous enough that anyone and everyone can read their own beliefs into it, unfortunately. All right. Thank you so much, brother. Jazakallah. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum brother Malik. Always good to see you. Uh, Malik, my, my answer to your question is I would be a Jehovah's Witness from Monday to Wednesday at least if I was trying to read the Bible and to be faithful to it as best as I can. I don't get that joke. Is it meant to be funny? <laughs> okay. So that what was yes. Islam like brother Malik. Just just a quick response to QWERTY. I, I I don't understand. You don't have to keep asking us for permission to bring people here or for us to mm. go anywhere. Listen, we're on an EF our live stream, right? We are not so desperate as to leave our well-attended live stream with the people that we care and love to go on a live stream to support some other useless platform. Whereas we we, we prefer good-natured, happy, uh, joyful conversations, peaceable conversations. We, we're not going to enter a place that is very abusive and intolerant, right? Uh, so everyone is welcomed here. You don't have to keep asking. Everyone is open to come to us because we want everyone to come to the truth of Islam. Uh, to the person saying, can you get our EF Dawah's email to invite them? My friend, we don't put restrictions. I'm going to say it one last time. You don't need to email us to set up a date. We're live every Sunday, literally, and anyone is welcomed. You can bring your mom, your dad, you can bring whoever you want, even your pastor. There were no restrictions. Hamza, do you check the gates to, to boot people out? Like, oh, you're not Christian enough? No, you're welcome. Everyone. We, actually welcome. Do, we do the opposite. Yeah, yeah, if you're Muslim, Muslim, we kick you out. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to remember, this is, 20, this is the 22nd stream. This is six months worth of streaming, every, virtually every week. And, you know, so this is almost like an established thing. So people know where we are. People no, know what we're people doing. People have done response videos to what we do. They I'm know not. where we are. <laughs> They're just afraid. And I don't blame them. I'll guide them, inshallah. Inshallah. I, All right, I, so I just, I, go ahead, Nasser. I, I was just going to respond to someone um said about 10 minutes ago. That, yes. Yeah, um, that we were lying. And 
that. So um, basically, Paul does say with regards to marriage in First Corinthians chapter seven, verse eight. Um, his advice is that you practice self-control. Um, however, um, in verse nine, he says that if you cannot exercise self-control, um, then you should marry. Uh, for it's better to marry than to uh, set yourself on fire. But then um, in verses um, 38 and forward, he says, so then uh, the ones who, who marry his virgin does well, but the one who doesn't marry uh, her does better. So, so in other words, uh, celibacy is better to, to remain single, like as, as Paul says that he is, um, than to get married. I want to point out to the audience, I don't want to be like Paul, so you know what you got to do, find me a wife and children. <laughs> and in, verse, in verse 31, he actually says, for this, for this world in its present form is passing away, right at the yeah. end. And this is, and I had the same thing out there, uh, Nazem, from our notes from last time. Yes. And I was just going to read the same thing. But right at the end of the verse, of, of verse 31, for those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them, for this world in its present form is passing away. And that was the point being made now. He's dying. He's near the end of his life in Philippians. And he's thinking, actually, I might die before this world comes to an end. Mm. And so this is where the dilemma came in. Should he be apologizing to the people who he's forbidden, you know, in a nice way from not becoming married? Mm. Okay, so uh, we've got two more Muslims and that's it, yeah? Ali and so, Mohammed. Charlotte, it's getting late now. Very unique names, I have to say. Let's do Ali first, inshallah. Ali, assalamu alaikum. Can you hear us? Talking about the mic's yeah, muted. You hear me? Yes, alhamdulillah. Yes, hey, how are, how you, are you today, guys? I really appreciate the stream. Very interesting. I just have a quick question, please. Uh, I was reading the, the Gospel of John, and uh, you said, just for my uh, understanding, that uh, John put uh, Jesus uh, more human, like as God. The question is, why did he leave the verse uh, 17 3 where he says, uh, the Father is the only true God? If he meant that uh, to, to put Jesus as defined. So, so the, there are two ways that you can read uh, uh, that, that passage, right? Uh, so, yes, um, he does elevate Jesus, but does he elevate Jesus until the point he's another member of the Godhead? This is the debate within academia. So some people, like Bart Ehrman, once had the opinion that it does not refer to Jesus as a God, but later on he thinks that enough of the references do lead to that conclusion. But generally speaking, people are of, two, are of two minds on this particular uh, book. It, yes, it elevates Jesus more than it does in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, right? It speaks of him literally as being the incarnate word of God. And so it takes on a more divine, on, on that scale of divinities, it's higher, but I don't think it's high enough to be added to the Trinitarian Godhead. That would be the difference for me, at least. I'm not sure what the other brothers have to add. Okay. I remember what uh, the way Nazim explained it once is that it, it's kind of like when they say the property prices are going up. Well, they don't always go straight up, but they might go up and, and, and uh, up and a bit down and then up and then a bit down and then up. But on the whole, they're going up. And so similarly, the development from the Gospel of Mark to the Gospel of John is the same way. It's not directly straight up, but it's mostly up with some dips and then up and then dips and then up. I hope that explains it a bit. Yeah, it does. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, last one is Brother Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum, Brother Muhammad. How are you? Wa alaikum salam. I'm good. How are you? Alhamdulillah, we're all alive for the time being. <laughs> Some right, of us good. may not be. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, my question is uh, regarding a uh, if someone is to commit something, a sin, but he didn't. You know, there's intentional sin and unintentional sin. Mm -hmm. So someone who did a sin, but didn't quite uh, believe in that in that sin at all. So like uh, I wanted, I was discussing on the, uh, on the chat, if I should say something I've committed. Um, you see, I don't, I want to talk about it because I think, I think I know God will forgive me. I know that 
it's just that I wanted to see what others say because when it comes to that sin, it's the highest on the levels of everything. I think you guys might have an idea of what, I, of what I'm trying to say. Uh, back in 2018, that was two years ago. I'm almost 21 now. Um, I have uh, met this woman that I, I live in Canada. I, I immigrated here since I was 13. So I met this woman and uh, I, you know, it was my first thing and I was like madly in love with her, blah, blah, blah etc. I was stupid. She was Christian. She tried to use my religion as a as a way to try to say, okay, this is a weakness in you that you need to fix, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, me, someone who prays five times a day, uh, I always do what God tells me to. I try to be the good person the Muslim should be. Uh, out of nowhere, I decided to to give, like, uh, go to church. Okay. Uh, now uh i for for two months for two two months i was uh it's like a like a blank statement that i um uh, that i had it was it was very blank you know i my mind was not in the right place i i, I did something really bad and um our brother, uh, brother, let, let's pause here and inshallah we can handle this off stream because it sounds like it's something quite private and it's very dear to you and we don't want to expose your sin. I know it's people, someone may recognize your voice, whatever the case may be, but because we care for you, stay on and inshallah as we end the stream, we will have a chit chat with you if we can. I think that would be better in, in this case, my brother, okay? Okay, I'm sorry, I, I, I shouldn't be... Um... I, I don't know. I, I shouldn't be emotional right now, but I'm, I'm sorry. Like, uh, it's just, I just wanted to, to talk because I talked to my dad and um, like, um, I, I, I don't know. I, I'll wait. I'll wait. I'll wait. Inshallah, my brother. All right, okay. brothers, what are your I final thoughts? Just, just very briefly, I think just to, I, I'm glad that you didn't uh, carry on, Brother Mohammed, And I think it's important to have the chat in, in private. And what I would say is that, uh, you know, sometimes you have to, Think about Allah and uh, His property and His abilities and who He is and His Majesty. And I know there's a verse in, in uh, Surah Nisa, I think it's uh, 137, around that sort of mark, where Allah talks about the, the people who have believed and then disbelieved and then believed. And He talks about people coming in and out of faith. And really, it's this. This is a process that can happen to anyone, and it's really about ultimately where you where you end up. But but, but the, this is really the key thing. So let's have the conversation we'll overall. Talk about after, no worries. But yes. Ultimately, uh, uh, if if you return to Islam or from whatever position you're in, then everything in the past is wiped away from from Allah. Obviously, you repent and you do this, and you take your shahada, and then you know, Mela, make it easy for you. But we'll have that conversation because it's clearly a motive, and we don't want to expose anything, brother, uh, from uh, about you at all. Mela, protect you, inshallah. So I believe in the yeah. Quran, Surah 39, verse 53, Allah reminds us, do not despair of the mercy of Allah. So keep that in mind, inshallah, and we'll get to you. Shortly. Allah forgives all sins uh, you know, when you repent. And, and just remember, this is not just for Brother Muhammad, but just in general, and it's a reminder to us as well, too, that, I mean, like Allah's rahmah, Allah's mercy is greater than our sins, right? Yeah. If you were to put it on a, if you were to put it on a balance, well, Allah's is, mercy is is far greater uh, because, than our because, sins. Because of what happened to me, it even made me stronger in faith than I ever mm -hmm. was before. I've learned, I've memorized Surah Al Kaf. Uh, yes, I'm, 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 I am memorized Surah Amran, and I've, I'm almost trying to finish Baqarah, and I've, I've done, I've learned a lot more, and I mm -hmm. never truly believe that's the thing that in my situation it was that's why i was asking about intention i never truly uh, believed that i never did and I, I've, I've always never did what they did anyways so that's what i'm Mohammed, just saying, relax but... we're gonna have a chat with you after the stream yeah so just stay on oh, don't leave don't yeah. leave backstage just stay on all right yeah. i had mm. to bring Tore on yeah 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 Tore. It, honestly no? okay. he, he he was he was here from the first five minutes and i said no muslims what? and he's come back at the end so subhanallah Okay. Salam, 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 brothers. Oh, ah, uh, oh, crap! He he's back. No, he's gone. What's going yeah, on? Yeah, he's now? back. <laughs> yes, I'm salam. back. Wa alaikum salam. Yeah, yeah. 
I would I would like to react to um, uh, the comment that uh, the brother Frank or the cousin Frank, because he's a cousin, is a, a cousin, is a Christian, uh, was making about the prophecies of Daniel, Daniel second and uh, Daniel seven. What I would like to say is that if Dan, if if Frank studies really well the prophecies of Daniel. He will revert to Islam. He will become a Muslim because D Daniel, the prophecies of Daniel about the four kingdoms uh, 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 succeeding on earth uh, after the, the Babylonian kingdom, the, the Persian kingdom, the, 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 the Greek kingdom, and then the Roman kingdom that divided into two and uh, represented by uh, 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 that division is represented by the 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 the, the beast, the, the the terrifying beast in the in Daniel seven with the ten horns, and that little horn that 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 grew among amid the ten horns, and that uprooted three of the the ten horns, and uh, and that had two eyes, two human eyes and a human mouth that was speaking great blasphemies against the eternal, against Yahweh. That little horn is Christianity. That little horn is Christianity that appeared in the midst of the fourth beast. And then the, the, the kingdom of God will be initiated by someone like a son of man, after the destruction of the the third of the the the, the, the third horn of the three the three horns that were uh, uh, will be destroyed by the little horn, one of them is the last is is the the that 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 third horn represent the Ostrogoths who were destroyed by the church, and it was the last barbaric kingdom of Europe Western Europe destroyed by the church. 18 years before the birth of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Prophet Muhammad is the only descendant of Abraham who said from his own mouth that, that he has been sent to all humanity, to the whole world. No prophet descending from Abraham ever, ever, ever said that he has been sent to the whole world. But Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said he has been sent to the whole world. Can I just say and one thing, Tori? Frank, Tori, Tori. Yes. Good luck, yes. Good luck explaining that to Frank. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care, Tori. You take care, Tori. Uh, I've seen this guy thank hanging you. around. I don't know who he is. Assalamu alaikum. Oh, very quickly, Saqib. Yeah, we got four, five minutes with you. Okay, oh. I want to thank all of you, brothers. It's uh, brother Imran, brother Nazim, brother Hamza, brother Ijaz, brother Sadat. You're doing a very great job, and may Allah reward you. Okay. And I want to especially yes, thank brother Sahib. Hamza that he is doing a very great job and uh, helping us in getting stronger in our faith. Alhamdulillah, by watching your videos, uh, I have got more stronger in faith. Alhamdulillah. Oh, and thank you very much, and uh, keep on doing this, inshallah. Jazakallah khair, Wow, that was less than a minute. Take care, my man. Inshallah. All right, um, should we wrap up? Yep, inshallah. Okay, so just let people know what's coming. Uh, what have we got on EF Dawah tomorrow, um, Dr. Imran? So tomorrow, I'll, I'll have a double check, and I'll tell you right now. Yes, the so Google it. Tomorrow, it. Yeah, we have a uh, e discussion, uh, the second part of the evolution discussion with Sheikh Abu Alia. So it's looking at evolution from an Islamic perspective. Very interesting discussion, inshallah. And um, please, uh, please tune in for that. And I think that will be uh, very, very interesting. Um, and there's and, it, and there's much more to come after that. So it, all the people who want to, we've been discussing technicality, technicality of evolution with Brother Hamza and, and Hamza's den with, with Brother Sabur. And this is really somebody people asked about the religious aspect of it, how we would do it religiously. This is the stream to come on to tomorrow on EF Dow, inshallah. To free in the past, myself and uh, Sheikh Abwali will be there. Inshallah, Brother Jordan will be there as well, uh, laptop permit permitting and Allah permitting, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Um, and then I have great pleasure in announcing that Brother Ijaz is going to be our newest gladiator in the arena on Friday, inshallah. 
Inshallah. He's going to fill the illustrious, bu illustrious boots of Brother Mansoor. Alhamdulillah. I hope I don't uh, get so, killed. That's all. So just so if you guys don't know what the arena is on Hamza's den, um, basically we ha we create a speaker's corner style uh, situation. So mashallah, we have Dr. Imran, we have Brother Ijaz, we have Brother Hashim, and we have Brother Yusuf Pondas and myself. And um, what we do, we invite people to come on. There's no um, set theme there's no um you can ask what you like basically and it's really really entertaining because you'll get an atheist then you get a christian then you get an agnostic then you might get a pantheist or, or whatever alhamdulillah so that inshallah that's on friday uh 9 p.m inshallah on hamza's den so check it out inshallah You're muted, oh, I forgot. Yeah, sorry. Uh, on Thursdays, alhamdulillah, it's been a long day. I've been streaming for like seven, almost eight hours now, actually. Uh, it's been a long day. Yeah, now doesn't let me get sleepy. It's like, it's 11 a.m. Wake up. Who wakes up at 11 a.m.? Come on. So um, <laughs> that's a joke, by the way. Everyone does. Uh, on Thursdays, alhamdulillah, we got uh, the Dava Collective from Calling Christians. We react to bad missionary claims. Everyone is invited to, to check us out. We start at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. British Standard Time, and everyone is welcomed. Uh, we look forward to it, inshallah. Yeah, and I'd like to say at this point, please, everybody, check out Calling Christians, mashallah. This is uh, Ijaz's channel, man. Like it, subscribe to it. Uh, Dr. Imran, your, um, is yours operational? So. My, my, I have a very old channel that people can tune into, inshallah. I may revive it soon, inshallah, called Foundational Thoughts. So I think it's very important to support the brothers who are uh, making the efforts in the Dawah. So we know the brother Sadat, mashallah, the, known as the Canadian brother, that Canadian brother YouTube channel, excellent show. He had a very interesting debate with a, a pastor very recently. And I think it's worth supporting, liking, sharing, because we want the brothers to have um, the exposure. So the people, when they're searching on the internet for their doubts and their worries, they have responses that can go to instead of finding anti-Islamic responses. We know Brother Nazim has a channel, Nazim 44. Um, please uh, subscribe to that. And obviously, EF Dawa, you, you're already aware of. We have a uh, conversation with Sam from Brother Abbas. And we're encouraging as many people as we can to actively be active uh, on YouTube and the, these platforms to give Dawa so that people have access to information to help them, inshallah, in their mind. Make, may Allah make our intentions pure and for his sake alone. I mean, I don't forget Hamza's den. You forgot Hamza's den. I thought that was. Uh, you did forget Hamza's den. Yeah, alhamdulillah. All right. Uh, now we get to 20,000 subs. Don't forget Ben Ikra's channel as well. Lovely oh, Ben Ikra. Ben Ikra's flying. Ben Ikra and Jordan yeah. M. Mashallah. Jordan yeah. M. Uh, come to success. Alhamdulillah. Yes. Mashallah. Yes. All right, guys. Let's knock it out. Thank you, brothers. Assalamualaikum, everybody. See you on Friday in the arena. London is blue. Don't forget. Sunday is Roman traffic next week. Thank <laughs> you.